you know, today, you know, ag tech is something we've been following for a couple of different directions. We've had a few babies start to grow up. Um, and I think it also inter interplays well with what we try to do with impact, uh, as we'll see in some interesting technologies that they can solve a lot of problems. And, um, and so we have a lot of some fund managers too that, that are in the space. So I think that's a smart way for us to, to all um, you know, back some funds and then the funds bring us deals in a nicely stewarded way. But with that, um, I'm just gonna put it back to, uh, to you on and uh, let you take the wheel. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for um, uh, letting me uh, moderate this event as well. And, and as you mentioned, there's overlap. You know, I'm not an expert on ag tech, but I'm very pleased to see the panelists today because they are experts at ag tech. Um, my overlap is in the, the cannabis space of ag tech. So um, this, but this event is going to be mainly the, the broader ag tech space uh, with, with some aspects on the cannabis side. And, and on the cannabis side, I just wanted to give a little uh, plug. Uh, we are going to be doing an event on Tuesday uh, at 1130 uh, this coming Tuesday. And that's part of a series that's going to be focused on the asset allocation side uh, and different asset classes that exist within cannabis. And then we may do another um, series uh, event focused on cultivation because we did not have cultivation featured in the, the event one month ago. So um, uh, but, but setting that aside, I wanted to start with a overall, um, just markers about our discussion today. So I think the value of today's discussion is going to be from uh, audience participation and Q&A and really um, thinking off the cuff and opening up what we know in our networks and our investments and our strategies. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll frame it by saying uh, that we're going to be talking about scalability um, sustainability and what I'm just calling salvage, which is not letting um, uh, produce go to waste and, and reusing it. So, uh, it, it, you know, that's just the overall kind of structure of the discussion. So we don't go too far into different uh, tangents and we have a baseline to come back to, but the tangents are going to be fun. So uh, I'll start off by uh, actually going to uh, Eddie Vanderpart, who has just got a few simple slides. There's a lot of great content that was sent in uh, uh, on the Actec space, but I figured we could start with his uh, high overview and then um, start to go into, uh, you know, each of the panelists uh, as, as an intro and then start going into some of the details. So the format will be, you know, we'll, we'll kind of talk about the uh, Actec space. If, as, as I call on the different panelists, if they could just give a quick uh, like five minute background on themselves. I've realized they're, they're much better at giving their backgrounds than I am. Uh, so I'll let them handle that. And, uh, and after that, at the end of, um, you know, some of those introductions, we'll, we'll start kind of talking about these uh, markers that I mentioned, the three markers and uh, connecting some of the dots here and then open it up to you, audience participation or, you know, other, other, uh, uh, panelists uh, or other moderators uh, going over uh, information. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Eddie, who I have, Eddie Vanderpart, who I have the pleasure of seeing on uh, quite often, uh, every week now on different matters. So, and I, I met to Mark on the 361 uh, platform. Um, so Eddie, if you could just give your quick kind of background and then uh, really light your uh, your slides and Andrew also you know right after that if you could introduce yourself and uh, I know you you both know each other and, and, and kind of chat about um, your background and, 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 and then I'll, I'll uh, jump back in uh, after that. All right thank you so much guys uh, appreciate it Anand appreciate it Mark this is great. Um, so my name is Eddie Vanderpart I'm originally Dutch uh, moved to the United States 20 years ago uh, that was a good move, I think. Um, so we, uh, I'm, I'm running a family office uh, for a Polish-American family and a lot of connectivity in Europe as well as in the US. Uh, and since a couple of months, I've started a fund with uh, also a 361 Cornerstone member, uh, Rich Sobel. Um, and with that fund, we are uh, focusing on, can, on, on impact investing. And, and uh, the, one of the pillars of impact investing is ag tech. 
And one of the reasons we do that uh, is it's super interesting. You will see that later on in the presentation, uh, but that all our family offices who are backing us are uh, part of the egg tech ecosystem. Uh, in, in one is in meat production, the other one is in salads, and the third one is in potato seeds. It's essentially a whole meal. Um, so, so, you know, one of the things, why, why is impact so important? Impact and ag agri-tech uh, inextricably linked is it solves many, you know, some, some verticals solve one or two things, but agri-tech tries to solve many different issues in the world, right? So uh, food shortage is one, uh, CO2 emissions is the other one, food waste, chemical residues, uh, labor shortages, um, health, sugar consumption, um, supply chain, distribution inefficiencies, you name it. So it's a, so it's a multitude of things. Um, and it'll be interesting to sort of, from a perspective of how to measure that, to have a discussion about that, but uh, not going into that, all of that right now. Um, but the, 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 the interesting thing for us is that, that it solves some of these issues in, 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 in a remarkable way. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, it's actually a significant industry. A lot of people ask us, well, we understand you're going in clean tech. It's a trillion dollar industry. We understand you're going into ad tech. It's a 90, $100 billion industry. But what is ag tech? Uh, and can we slow show the slides, uh, Anand? Uh, yeah, give me one second here. Hey, Inessa, do you happen to have that or... Yeah, I imported them. Okay, if you could pull that. Inessa to the rescue. Okay. Otherwise, I can share my screen, but it's easier for Ines to show, I think. I think, are these the slides, Eddie? I don't see um, it right now. You don't share your screen. Ah. Starting okay. from slide 13. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So you, That's you it. Screen then. Okay. Maybe you can zoom in. Um, so, so AgTech is uh, an industry that grew, grew, you know, essentially close to 30% of the last five years and is right now a $30 billion industry, which is very significant. A lot of people don't know that. Um, and it's, it's, it's built up of a lot of different, um, uh, different categories. Uh, and we delineate sort of downstream and upstream, just like with oil in a way. Um, can you move to the second slide? Yeah, so, so the 30 billion is essentially um, uh, delineated upstream and downstream is roughly the same size. The largest deal, for example, uh, upstream was a cold chain storage called Lineage. We've got 1.6 billion. And that's sort of what we call midstream, so the distribution between sort of the upstream where we produce things and the downstream where we consume things, globally speaking. Um, and uh, you, you can think of a, a number of sectors that are sort of uh, prevalent here. Um, uh, marketplaces, bioenergy, biomaterials, farm management software, robotics, midstream technology, as just, I just mentioned, uh, novel farming systems, which I want to talk more about later. And obviously, Andrew has a lot to say about novel farming systems as well. Um, and, and a couple of people on the call as well. Innovative food solutions. Uh, think of uh, you know vegan, uh, plant-based meat, the, the big um, uh, craze in that. And but also, for example, non-dairy uh, uh, milk products, um, uh, uh, which are you know a two billion dollar industry right now. Um, in store, you know, downstream you've got in-store retail, restaurant marketplace, e-groceries, home and cooking tech online restaurants and meal kits and th those kinds of uh, those kinds of sort of subcategories. Can you move to the third slide? So here it breaks down in a bunch of categories. Um, and um, well, you know, I I'll go over the, the first couple big ones. Uh, and you see also the sort of deal, the number of deals and the deal sizes, um, you know, we talked about midstreams or linear logistics, which made up of made made uh, the largest category up uh, one one point six out of the out of the number of billions that you see there. E groceries is another one. Um, in store retail is the third one, uh, and innovative foods is the is the fourth one. 
And so when we talk about Actec, all the that's the and you know we span up an entire universe of of, of uh, many different interesting segments. Um, and I, I want to go into later maybe um, one of the segments that we're looking at currently uh, innovative farming, but I think that the idea was to do that a little later and have a couple of examples of how we look at things. Yep. Um, thank you for that overview, uh, Eddie. That's very helpful. And so, you know, I'll, I'll kind of leave it at this high level in terms of the, the discussion, but uh, we'll, we'll move on to uh, uh, Andrew so he can kind of give background. And then uh, Andrew also, you know, on specific examples of companies you're involved with, it'd be great to touch base on that, uh, either as you're talking about your bio or when we go into uh, the detailed discussion later on. I, I've got um, a something, a, a trick I learned from Toastmasters, which I used to do years ago, which is to turn my background into uh, yellow uh, if you're kind of running uh, on the uh, allotted time. Um, so it will look like this and it's pretty noticeable. And uh, Mark uh, does the same. So I, I can do it or Mark can do it for this round. Uh, and then um, if you yeah. see, that's, that's like the Oscar music playing. So that, that doesn't really happen too much, but yeah. Um, but, uh, but, you know, if you, Andrew, if you could speak for about uh, five minutes, Eddie, you, you, you hit it right on the mark. So you're, you're perfect. Uh, you didn't have to see any colors. Uh, Andrew, if you could uh, talk for a little bit, maybe for until 11, 20 or so on kind of your background and involvement in the active space. Yeah, certainly. Um, thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak. Uh, some of you might have uh, heard of us before, but just kind of background kind of broader on the firm and then kind of our more specific focus now pertains to today. So I, I work for Cirrus Partners. We're a, about a billion dollar food and agriculture investment firm. The large majority of that is in a farmland fund, um, a row crop farmland fund that's been around for about 13 years where we buy farmland and, and lease it to a network of farmers that we work closely with. Um, it's been one of the best performing farmland funds in the country. And so we have kind of a huge investor base and a lot of kind of deep seated agriculture knowledge. And in some senses, I kind of make the joke where agriculture people doing private equity rather than private equity people doing agriculture, um, which is you know, either a good or bad distinction. But uh, we, after having all this farmland, we started to get a lot of inbound interest from operating businesses saying, hey, we, based on what you guys are doing, we'd love for you to invest in us. And so that kind of started the, what was a very small kind of first time private equity fund. And, and our interest really started in kind of more primary processing asset backed businesses. And as we've been doing this now for about five years, we've actually gone much heavier into the ag tech side of things as well as ESG specifically. So in the past, we've done things like aquaculture, which has, you know, huge ESG impacts. Um, and then other things for the kind of craft beer and um, wine industry, but more specifically, and what we're kind of raising on going forward is kind of this notion that especially pertaining to ag tech, that sustainability drives returns. You know, you typically people think of impact funds. There's probably a little bit of a notion of concessionary returns. You know, I'm going to be okay to accept a little less if I know that I'm doing right by the world. Well, I think in our, in our view, and I'm sure Eddie would probably agree and many other people on this panel, is there's not that trade-off anymore. The things that are making companies more sustainable is what's driving more to the bottom line. So we're going to talk ultimately about it later. We have a greenhouse business that we started called Pure Green Farms and just the indoor market in general. You know, the, we would use 95% less water, zero pesticides, you know, the 90, 95% reduction in food miles. All of those things make it much more sustainable, but at the same time, reduce our cost structure. We have an incredibly high degree of automation so that you have very few people, you know, involved in the business, frankly. There's no human hand that ever touches the product, right? So those are the things that are, really impactful. And so one of the other notions that we talk a lot about is how small companies can disrupt large markets. So you know, that's the thing is that we spend a lot of time looking at. So whether it's this greenhouse business, we have two other investments in the indoor growing space from a camera technology and also robotic harvesting. Those are smaller companies that can be incredibly transformative for some of the really big challenges that are facing food and agriculture going forward. You know, and frankly, as you look about kind of the broader investing market, it's a less competitive one too, where food and agriculture takes up eight or 9% of the US GDP, but represents less than 1% of investment dollars. So in my experience and now doing this for kind of almost six years now at Cirrus is I find the competitive market much more collaborative than it is true competition. 
the last two investments we did is because we got a call from kind of neighboring or competitive groups that said, hey, based on what you guys are doing, I think you'd be a good fit for this. And so we find it to be much more collaborative, which I think, you know, you're not necessarily having the same huge drive up in crazy valuations, although it does happen some, you know, that you would see in other markets with like fintech and healthcare and things like that. So if we're really excited about kind of where we're positioned right now, we've got you know, eight deals under our belt, you know, about to launch what is likely to be another large um, fund to be kind of focused exclusively on indoor agriculture, because I think is a really important niche there. Um, and a lot of transformation that's going on across the entire value chain. Uh, and so I can maybe a minute or two uh, left, but I think there's going to be a lot that happens. There's going to be uh, you have probably already starting to see kind of huge influxes of money come into the space and having the right networks, I think can go a long way. And this isn't something that I don't think ag, te ag tech or agriculture in general lends itself as well to, you know, there's a lot of generalist investors that might have a sleeve that say, I'm going to do agriculture over here and then I'm going to do health care over here. You know, I, we really think in being kind of fully entrenched in the agriculture market, that that's where you know you can get access to the best deals, and um, you're not kind of paying these crazy premiums as you hear about things later down the road. So um, it's been a really exciting kind of transition to us and for us into kind of more the ag tech because you can catch things at kind of that late venture, early growth stage, and it can really be transformative. And so we we think the portfolio we built thus far has been really good, and want to continue to to build on that. But ESG is a huge part of every what everyone needs to consider going forward. And the, I think the biggest takeaway that we'll, we'll come back on is you don't have to think about it as a trade-off anymore. The things that make these companies sustainable are what make them more profitable. So with that, I'll, I'll pause for now. Thank you, Andrew, that's really helpful. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll dig into some of the specifics uh, when it opens up. So um, thanks for the overview. Uh, next up, I'd like to uh, turn it over to uh, Richard Lackey, um, who I've had the pleasure of meeting more recently, but uh, Richard, I loved uh, having the discussions we had kind of pre preparing for today. Uh, and, and I'll turn it over. Feel free to use your slides or any other content that you have. And Inessa, if you could uh, cue that up um, in, in case Richard needs it, that'd be great. Thanks, Anand. I'm delighted. I appreciate it. And um, I would concur with Andrew. I think that there's, you know, for a number of years, I've been speaking on this uh, this construct of, of uh, impact investing is, is, you know, a common term from outside of the ag tech space. And there's a, uh, there's a variation of, of per expected performance versus return. And, and there's a heavily social component, environmental component with very little return. And then there's others that, um, that have very high returns. And I think that there is a, a growing plethora of opportunity in those spaces where you can have incredibly high ESG impact while also making above average market returns. So um, that's the sweet spot for us as greedy capitalist pigs. Um, we did name our fund that, but that's, you know, that, that's kind of the model. It's the low hanging fruit, the ability to go in and change up systems, be a little bit disruptive and uh, bring people together. Our, our model, um, and I'll get more into this later, but our model really is built to, to solve the problem of scale. And, and we did approach, uh, we, we still do approach what we do from, from a, almost a legacy standpoint. Our goal is to have a measurable, quantifiable impact on the world with regard to food and poverty. Um, as a, before I tell you where I stand, I'll tell you where I sit. I'm, my, I have about eight years in emergency medicine and about 25 years in hedge fund and asset management. Uh, I was a commodity trader and uh, financial markets trader for um, most of that time and develop systems for identifying inefficiencies in global markets. And um, the largest single arbitrage, the largest single inefficiency in markets today is the inefficiency between farm gate and regional market. In Sub-Saharan Africa alone, and this is work that I did with the World Food Program in Rome, um, the inefficiency is somewhere between 800 billion and $1.1 trillion per year. And so that's the opportunity uh, just in that niche of the market space. And if you take that average volatility and uh, or the average volatility of those markets in the US markets, we, the majors, corn, soy, wheat, sugar, rice would have your around 24% 
from low to high on an average year at one standard deviation of volatility. They peak above and below that, but it's an average of about 24%. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it's 64%. And that 64% means that small farmers are not bankable, insurable, or investable. It means that many manufacturers shut down three months a year because the cost of inputs is too high. So if you're able to resolve that problem by improving the quality of, of commodities and making them available throughout the rest of the year, you can solve a lot of problems. So we'll, we'll talk more uh, about that in a minute. If we can pull up the slide real quick, I'll just, I'll cover a couple of them. You wanna show the video, Rich? Um, well, you know what, I can, I can actually skip over to the video piece and we're gonna start it at, at a minute 20. If oh, that's I'm gonna shook up. Yeah, let's hold on it for just a second. But yeah, it started at 120. But um, so I'll give you the background real quick. So I run an organization now called the World Food Bank. It is a for-profit organization. Our goal is to resolve those challenges, to lift uh, 10 million people out of poverty in five years, 100 million out of poverty in 10 years. And we have the math to prove that we can get this done now. Um, the World Food Bank was designed to take advantage of that inefficiency in markets to be able to buy from farmers when prices are crashing because they all sell everything at harvest to stabilize those prices and incentivize them to grow more and better quality by guaranteeing a minimum market price for maize, soy, wheat, sorghum, what have you. And on the other side, when prices, like we're, last year in Uganda, we're buying at $220 a ton and, uh, and then three months later, it's $360 a ton, that inefficiency in market price is, um, is pretty staggering, a lot more than the opportunity that we would expect if we, were, um, if we were trading in traditional US and European markets. So the ability for us to go in and buy in those markets and store, and the catalyst for that is the storage, and we'll have skipped over that picture, I think, but um, we use 100 metric ton bags that are airtight they have no moisture or gas transference across the barrier. So we're able to hold commodities for 15 plus years. And we actually have grain that's been in bags for more than 15 years that still is grade one. So that ability to remove the calendar risk gives us the opportunity to resolve a lot of calendar related problems. So Richard, as we've gone want, into- Richard, sorry, um, do, you want, do you want to run these slides yourself? You got yeah, am I able to do to that? Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing them. You go, go for it. Okay, let's see if I can do that. Um, sorry about that. Or just guide so, me. So what am I doing now? Am I sharing, I'm looking at your. You can share a screen, yeah, and then you, you can share your deck. Um, or you can guide me, you, I mean, it looks like you got it, good. Do I have it now? Yep. Okay. Uh, move this back over. Okay, so. Uh, quite, quite briefly, the 800 million people that live in the world, to um, Andrew's earlier point, the 800 million people that we rely on for agriculture in the world are also living in poverty. So if you're able to solve the problem of getting those farmers who are growing one-tenth or one-twelfth of what they should be growing per acre by using improved practices, better soil management, better seeds, and what have you, uh, you'll actually solve not only the problem of poverty for those folks, but you'll actually solve the problem of food security globally. So in the next 10 years, when we have another billion to feed, the dollars uh, will be in the system and the food will be coming out of the system. The problem we found is multiple. There's 12 or 15 critical components of agriculture and many of those are broken in places like Sub-Saharan Africa. The solution that we found is focusing on these four, education, because people can't do what they don't know, access to quality inputs because they're using leftover seeds and poor quality and what have you, and in some measure, some finances, as they get to where they're using those things, if they can use better, um, if they can use better products and have access to finances to finance those inputs, that would be uh, a, a big benefit. The final thing to incentivize them to use that, uh, to, to use the education they've had to, um, and to source the inputs is to know that there's a market to guarantee offtake to buy from them. And so that's what World Food Bank does. We guarantee the market if, there's a, if they will use the quality inputs and, and what have you. To really solve this problem though, we were using this technology to catalyze, that's the picture of the bags I was explaining before. But, the, um, but what really came to, to uh, the forefront for us was when I was appointed to the board of USAID 
And I'm going to skip through a couple of slides here for the sake of time. And we came across a company that had been doing educational entertainment media. And they do television programming and radio programming and now have a digital platform that reaches uh, millions of folks on a, on a weekly basis. We have 12 million weekly viewers. And that TV show is literally like a home makeover show, but, a, but for farmers in sub-Saharan Africa. And they go into the local farms, they identify the problems and they help solve those problems. And just to give you an idea what it is, it's not fancy HGTV, it's very basic, but the very basic nature of it is why so many people like it and watch it and pay attention to it. So um, let's see, where is the, uh, I don't have the video on here. Uh, okay, well, that's okay. Hey, in, in essay, if you could uh, cue up the video and play it, Richard, you might have to just stop uh, sharing your screen. And you said it was at the one minute 20 mark? Right, at the one minute 20. Um, there we go, so I'll stop sharing mine. That we can watch that real quick and then uh okay and then we'll yeah we'll be done essentially Inessa, are you able to or mark are you able to play that or we can come back to it in yeah, one second okay um and i really like that slide richard that you had on the four areas you focus on so i may ask uh somebody to bring that up again as far as education inputs and uh, capital and, and, and markets, because it's relevant, I think, to the overall discussion as well. Um, as, as we're kind of waiting for that to queue up, you know, one area that has uh, been brought up, which I think is very interesting, is, is disruption. So I'll uh, be kind of looping that into the the other uh, other key areas. Um, since since we're having a little trouble queuing okay. that, well, yeah. Um, oh, there it is. Uh, yeah, go ahead and play that at 120 or so. Yep. Thanks, Anessa. And the show is called Shamba Shape Up. A Shamba is a small farm in Kiswahili. So the show is a home, is a farm makeover. So it's called Shamba Shape Up. Okay, so you have to move it up to 120. There we go. Yeah. Can, can you hear it? No, the audio, it doesn't seem to be too loud. Too loud? It's not, it's not, it's not coming through on the audio. It's okay, Anessa. Just for the sake of time, I can, I can share with you. It's video just has a, has a great it. impact. Yeah, why don't we do the link? The link is able to be shared out in the chat. People could probably okay. directly do it if it's accessible. This they're essentially talking, you can leave it running and I can kind of chat over it, but essentially they're, they're teaching farmers about chickens and pigs and goats as, as well as maize and soy and wheat and rice. And they did a study with 13,000 farmers in 25 counties of Kenya. And they found that 87% of those who watched the show actually changed some of their practices. 50% of those adopted specific practices and 36% actually did exactly what was pertinent. So they bought the, they bought the recommended seed. They, they bought the, uh, uh, the organic fertilizer and they harvested and they dried all in the same way shown on the, sh on the program. And these are the results, $24.7 million in improvement just in those areas in one year. What in the net of that is that farmers are going from the edge. These are all the awards that it's won, uh, Gates and Rockefeller and um, folks all over. We're now in Kenya, headed to Uganda, planning on Ethiopia next year, uh, and actually perhaps Indonesia. But the 36% uh, of those people actually were on the, went from the edge of poverty to the edge of middle income in 18 months. Wow. With four and a half million people watching the program in the first season, and a little more than that after that. We now have 12 million viewers on a weekly basis. But 36% of those is 1.6 million people. So literally on an annual basis, we're taking 1.6 million people from the edge of poverty to the edge of middle income at a cost of about, of about 50 cents per person. So it's the most cost effective product or program I've ever seen. It's the most efficient, effective and efficient one USAID has ever seen. So we bought the company and we're now raising some dollars and expanding into other countries. And because it has corporate and non-corporate sponsors, it's actually a profitable platform and we'll talk more about the digital side of it later. But the digital side has given us the ability to build a true relationship and a real ecosystem by communicating on a weekly basis with people. So 
I'll stop there. I don't, I don't want to take any more time. And I'll, thank you. No, thank you. That, that video was worth the uh, wait. So that's a fantastic <laughs> stat. Um, appreciate that. Um, and then, yeah, we will be circling back to it. Uh, and, and then I'd like to also introduce uh, F. Lindenbaum, who's, uh, who I consider a friend, and it's been great interacting with him in the overlap that we both have. And, you know, I'm in the Canvas space, as noted, uh, but F. has been in the ag tech space for uh, about 20, 20 plus years now. So I'll let, I'll turn it over to F. if you want to uh, give a background first, and then um, you know, I'll, I'll circle back around and start the kind of panel discussion right after you have your, your uh, five minutes of uh, time. So go ahead, F. Excellent. I'm going to screen share here. So if you could uh, just allow that one, that would be great. Are we up yet? Um, not yet. It takes a second, but uh, Anessa, did you give permission there or... Mark, you're on uh, mute. Everyone always has permission. There's, you, you oh, should okay. You should be able to, oh, there we go. Now it's showing up. Great. Excellent. So let me make sure I can still see you folks. Excellent. Great. So uh, my name is uh, Ephraim Lindenbaum. I'm the Managing Director of Advanced Ventures. We're a historic Silicon Valley venture capital fund. Uh, you know, by way of background, I'm a recovering entrepreneur and operator. So I'll tell you a little bit about advance and then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of key off into some of the areas that we invest in, particularly Av to ag tech. So as I mentioned, we're a Silicon Valley fund. We've been investing now for over 20 years across three successive $100 million funds. We're at the tail end of our third fund, about to raise our fourth with a uh, over-the-top managed co-fund we're investing in as well. You know, we really focus on enabling our entrepreneurs to take bold risks, go out and build great companies, and achieve really meaningful venture scale exits. And having done that myself, I think it gives a very unique perspective of being able to not only manage capital, but we manage a significant amount of our own capital as well as our LPs. By way of background, as I mentioned, we're in Silicon Valley. You know, when you look at the global deal flow, whether that's ag tech, SaaS, AI, big data, et cetera, Silicon Valley is the heart of the matter. Uh, you know, from a deal perspective, it dwarfs any other part of the world. If a deal is not getting done in Silicon Valley for the most part, uh, you know, oftentimes it's, it's chances of success and meaningful exit are, are, are significantly lower. And in particularly, uh, you know, most of the great deals don't get out of Silicon Valley. And myself being on the board of pretty much some of the most meaningful ag tech companies in the world, I share a sort of board level interaction with, uh, you know, I would say 90% of the global ag tech funds, whether they're uh, independent institutional or CVCs. Uh, so, you know, most of the deals never make it out of the valley. It's a very important uh, aspect to remember. And then in terms of my background, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I'm a recovering entrepreneur. I started my first company in my teens. I grew that company through the late 80s and 90s, 350 people in seven countries, got ready to file our S1 in 1998 to go public. And the first dot-com boom was CSFB. And right as that happened, uh, a, a huge M&A offer came in. I remember the banker, Frank Quattrone, a very famous guy in the dot-com era coming to me and saying, F, what do you want to do? And I said, look, I, Frank, I'm 30. I'm expecting you to give me an answer. And he looked back at me and he said, this dot com thing is just really unknown by all of us. And I said, look, I had a number of investors. I had a, uh, a management team that had been with me for 11 years. I wanted to deliver the meaningful exit. So I was sort of the dumbest guy you've met for not going public in the dot com bomb. And a couple years later, smartest guy you ever met for not going public in the dot com bomb. So Completed my exit in 1999, spent about six months as the chief strategic officer of the Acquirer and came back to Silicon Valley in 1999. I, I attempted to retire at 30 and start a foundation and spend uh, a third of my time in nonprofit, but I really wasn't good at retiring. So effectively, I spun up Advanced Ventures with uh, a number of great uh, tech entrepreneurs in the Valley and bankers here. And, you know, it's somewhat binary in Silicon Valley when you exit. You either start your next company or become an investor. I jokingly say I didn't have any great ideas. You know, we've been very blessed or lucky over the years. We've had an exit every 14 months since the founding of the fund. And, uh, you know, we were funded on three core tenants, technology, 
immobility and sustainability. We were the fir- one of the first true sustainability funds in Silicon Valley dating back to 1999. We're one of the three remaining venture funds from that maiden era. So that either means we're pretty good at what we do or we're uh, gluttons for punishment. We're part of the active ecosystem here in Silicon Valley, which is very tried and true. Uh, it applies to ag tech, SaaS, and every other level of technology uh, and food tech as well. We acro- invest across the sector. I like lecture at Stanford University in the Business School on Board Governance, on Venture Capital at Haas Berkeley School, uh, at Santa Clara University, and at San Jose State University. You know, we are very active in terms of the broader ecosystem, in terms of the media, the ag tech conferences. You can find me keynoting at most of those as well. We look at technology, which very much applies to ag tech today as as one of the largest categories. I think some of my colleagues on the panel mentioned robotics. They mentioned some of the other areas that are improving the food chain. But today, you know, as you can imagine, evolving over 20 years, we really sort of slot our investments across three core, four core themes, Uh, fintech digital health or, or med tech, food and agriculture. And we really broadly look at ag tech and food tech as very much the same area. And what I brought today, just to kind of wrap up my little intro here, is a couple of different categories that we invest in. We invest with a barbell strategy. So we allocate roughly a third of our fund to early stage seed and very early series A companies. Then we wrap back around carrying those uh, successive companies through and do a number of later stage, approximately 10 out of each of our fund later stage investments. Uh, and, and has you know, really delivered over 100 deals invested and uh, nearly an 18% exit trajectory with a 36% combined IRR over the course of the multiple funds. And I'd love to show a little bit of a, a quick video here as it applies to the uh, ag tech space and particularly as it, as it applies to, uh, you know, if you will, the, the hemp category, because I think that that gets very, very interesting as well. So uh, let me pull this up. Can you folks hear the audio and video? We can hear the audio, but uh, there's the video. Now we see it. The audio is a little uh, low, so can't quite hear it. I think the audio is uh, not technology. I, I, do we want to pause here and talk about the wrapping up? Um, Great. Sorry, I can't see you folks as easily here. So, uh, is is it gone back to my video? It's showing your screen share still. Uh, oh, okay, great, great, great. Let me go back to my uh, video screen here. How's that? Are you back on video? Uh, no, it's still showing your your virtual background screen right now on our, on our screen. Okay, let's see. Um, on on so so let me yeah let me uh, uh, talk about the the company you were just bringing up. So uh, in terms of background uh, and connecting it to the the three areas we were talking about um, on scale of, uh, scalability, sustainability, and, and salvage. So on on scalability, I'll just give a connection to. Um, to the talk we had about a month ago on the cannabis front. As, as I mentioned, you know, this is Bar Capital's view, so it, uh, you know, it'll give that grain of salt, but we think that something significant could happen this year in the cannabis space on, a regulatory, uh, on the regulatory front, which doesn't have to be, you know, cannabis is legalized, but will give a signal that uh, it is going to be legalized uh, in a big way, uh, you know, whether that's banking reform or, other aspects. Um, so one thing that could happen in, in, a, in an area like cannabis is we could have a huge amount of demand that will start to open up in the next 12 to 24 months, not just in the U.S., but also globally. Here in New Jersey, for example, we passed recreational 
And I know it from several law firms uh, here that, um, you know, Governor Murphy has basically said, you have about six months, if you're a municipality, to come up with your rules and figure out how you're going to get a cut of the cannabis business. If you don't, it's still going to roll out and those businesses will be allowed to open up, um, you know, as, as per kind of state level guidelines. And, you know, it, you, you won't get to basically regulate them as, as you'd like. So one way or the other, it's happening. So all of these municipalities uh, are now moving on how they're going to incorporate it into their, into their systems. Um, so along those lines, if that happens, and, and, and whether that happens or not, you know, the momentum in this industry is uh, such that, um, you know, I'll give another example real quickly. There was a news a couple of nights ago about uh, Cureleaf purchasing a company that's vertically integrated in the UK called Emac. I was on the phone with several colleagues I know there that knew Emac well, you know, it, it wasn't really that far developed, but Cureleaf thought it would be great to purchase a footprint uh, in Europe and, uh, you know, being the biggest, uh, you know, MSO, uh, it, it is already making moves to secure a global footprint. So the demand is coming and they're all getting ready for it. Um, so F, if you could just talk about uh, that and then I'll open it up to the other panelists about uh, scalability, but could you talk about front range biosciences and kind of how they're in that ecosystem? We did discuss uh, tissue culture at the event um, so people who might have attended a month ago have a sense of that, but if you could talk about the, uh, why that's critical in scaling in this, in this uh, ecosystem. Sure, certainly. And, you know, I think it applies both to hemp and cannabis. To, to take a, a particular path that many of the other uh, colleagues and panelists have been speaking about is from a sustainability standpoint, you know, hemp is arguably one of the most amazing plants from a global standpoint. It is a food crop with one of the most uh, effective per gram protein supplies that can be grown in, in roughly any, uh, you know, environment. It is a, uh, you know, a fiber crop that can be used for energy, it can be used for clothing, et cetera, et cetera. And then in turn, you know, this entire concept around both the CBD, that's the, uh, so to speak, the non-psychoactive aspect of, of hemp being a medical product of which there are, uh, you know, nearly a thousand medical research programs underway, phase three, phase four clinicals already. Uh, and then THC, which is a psychoactive compound that, that broadly is considered the cannabis side of the plant. You know, for a company like Front Range, of which I'm on the board, has raised around uh, $45 million to date, they look at the plant in precisely the same way. So they are developing, as Anon mentioned, tissue culture. That's the beginning of the supply chain. So Front Range has developed the largest bioinformatic database in the entire category of hemp and cannabis. That means all of this development, whether it's medical, sustainability, protein, recreational cannabis, edibles, any of those categories all roll up out of the same genetics. And you might've heard about Jazz Pharmaceuticals buying GW for around $5 billion recently. Any of the companies, whether it's a big pharma, big tobacco, big nutrition, et cetera, need to start at the head of the supply chain. From genetics, you move to tissue culture. Tissue culture gives you a mechanism to rapidly scale up. So for example, Front Range is developing stack traits in hemp. That's one of the most meaningful impact points for a global sustainability. That's the ability in a single plant to produce what they call grain or the hemp seeds for protein and the stocks for fiber and energy production all in the same plant, which is effectively to take a, you know, colloquial word, weed. So effectively, this will grow anywhere. Poor soil, terrible weather, very little water, yet they can still get that out of there. But, it, you know, at the end of the day, Syngenta's and Monsanto, the global seed companies, have, have not been able to move into this category because of the regulatory environment for 40 years. So effectively, you know, Front Range has taken a page from both of those companies and are rapidly developing through tissue culture and field trials, much of this stack trait. Now that can apply to unique cannabinoids. Uh, you know, one of their cannabinoids is, is, is currently being used in the Dana, Car uh, Dana Research Center, uh, Cancer Center. Uh, sorry, Dana Farber Research Center. Uh, others are being used in the pharmaceutical space. You know, others are used in the recreational space. But at the end of the day, this is one of the most exciting plants that's been out of the research cycle for the last 40 years. Thanks. Uh, that, that's great uh, in terms of the background. And so I'd like to open it up to the panel 
uh, on this scalability theme, um, and 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 I guess disruption ties into that. If if uh, and and feel free to jump in, or I'll start pointing to the panelists. But if if, if you could kind of talk about the scope of what you're talking about, uh, you know, Richard shows showed us the video and and kind of the sub-Saharan uh, African focus, and and that's a very significant uh, scale and, and and also disruptive uh, focus. Uh, as an example. Um, so Richard, feel free to talk a little bit more uh, and, and, and do a deeper dive there. But uh, I'd love to hear about investments that each of the panelists has, has been looking at or has been involved with that has the most scalability potential um, in the portfolio or disruption. Well, I mean, we're a venture fund. So, you know, we, we've done 100 deals. Uh, you know, we've got a deal flow track of about uh, 3,000 deals a year. We do about five to seven of those deals. Uh, you know, when it applies to food, agriculture, you know, uh, you know, I think from our standpoint, we're looking at some very innovative areas. For example, decontamination technology that's using ozone to decontaminate uh, you know, uh, uh, pathogenic contamination in food and agriculture. This is usually usually critical because this is an upstream step. So if you want to talk about waste stream and reuse of waste stream, you need a, a pathogenic kill step there. Uh, this is also utilized in, in plants like cannabis, in vegetables. We're investors in, uh, you know, the regulated side of molecular diagnostics. So what one of our investments is a high-speed food and pathogenic testing company called Pathogen DX. It essentially can test the pathogenic load, E. coli, aspergillus, et cetera, within the food production and packing industry in less than four hours, which means that historically that was a Petri dish or other form of technology that takes two to three days. That means a grower, packer, shipper ships out lettuce to your, to your retail environment and then recalls lettuce three days later. So that's a huge hit on both you know, the economics, on the brand, et cetera. Our company makes technology within a single shift, meaning that the produce comes in in the morning, they can test it, and before it leaves the facility at the end of the day for distribution, they can halt it in process. I mean, if you look at it, foodborne illnesses is one of the biggest challenges out there. So those are, you know, sort of a, a high level. We're also investors in mycotechnology. They're the leader in plant-based protein. They're using mycelium. So with sorry, F, on the lettuce side, because I, that's actually a common theme uh, among some of the panelists uh, from just background that I've known. Uh, would like to focus in on that as a, as a specific example, because you, you're talking about, you know, the testing side. Um, Eddie or Andrew, if you have any uh, any information on kind of the uh, harvesting uh, side of, of that and, and, and the disruptive technology on that, would love to hear that as well. How about, uh, how about a start and then Andrew can sort of follow on? I guess I, I think that's, um, that might work well as, as we also talked a lot to each other. So, so we're, we're looking at um, all, kind, all kinds of ways into more effectively farm in the US. Uh, in, it can be vertical farming, can be indoor uh, hydroponic farming. And if you, for example, look at scalability and at food waste, um, right now over 90% of, of, of maybe even 95% of, of, of America's lettuce and, uh, is, is made in California and Arizona. Uh, and if you, if you show your eight-year-old daughter a map of the states and say, what will be a good distribution point, a number of distribution points, she would, she would say that this is sort of uh, kind of insane, right? The average lettuce uh, travels over a thousand miles. So... So, uh, and on top of that, it's, it's, it's made with 10 times as much water and maybe up to 100 times as much land as it may, could be. Um, if you introduce sort of various different technologies of, of, of indoor farming, Andrew is a good point, a uh, good, good, uh, good example of that. Um, you, you can significantly reduce waste, significantly improve productivity. Uh, and get everybody fresh, fresh, fresh lettuce instead of stale, uh, um, bad, bad tasting lettuce. And so we're looking at te technologies around, uh, you know, automated farming, uh, be it horizontal or vertical, uh, and think that's going to disrupt the world. I know there's a couple other people on the on the chat that are also uh, are very much into that. But I think uh, uh, in the states, that's a, that's a uh, a the incumbent here is weak and needs to be slain by new technology. Uh, and and uh, the variety of mechanisms are there. We're, we're looking at and we think is this a start? This will be a very big shift over the next five to 10 years. Yeah, thank you, Eddie. That's a good uh, transition there. 
For us as, as Sears Partners, we looked at the market for a number of years before we actually made an investment. We, we could talk to lots of different groups out there between vertical farming, greenhouses and everything in between, every growing style, to try to figure out what really made sense. And before we actually then started, you know, Pure Green Farms, and, uh, which is now officially hitting the market as of this week and, and booking sales and starting to deliver to Kroger and a few other large retailers, which is really exciting for us. And we're huge believers in automation because of the increases of efficiency, yield, and safety, frankly. I mean, I think we've all probably had the experience. I remember a couple of years ago getting a CNN notification a couple of days before Thanksgiving to not eat any lettuce because of contaminants. I mean, for CNN to send an alert to your phone, you know, it's a pretty big deal. So, you know, there is, you look at the way things are growing in California and Arizona, and they've been growing like that for a very long time, but there are just inherent logistical challenges, certainly pesticides and chemicals, and there's a lot of just waste. I think something in the neighborhood of, you know, 10 to 20% of what is grown doesn't actually make it to a plate because it's either lost in the harvesting process, the cleaning, you know, triple wash in a chlorine bath, or there's spoilage in the truck. And so there's a lot of food waste that goes into it. So we look at investment in pure green farms and others like that. There are certainly other groups that that can um, you know, grow lettuce well. And we're kind of in the very early innings um, of how this market will continue to transform. But in, in our situation, we can truly say that the consumer will be the first person to ever touch the product. Seeding, growing, harvesting, packaging in an incredibly you know, food safe, you know, highest rated way so that you remove a lot of those outside variables that you have to deal with in a field. And, that, and that's true of all, you know, indoor farming, because I know there's other people here on the, on the call that are in that space too, where, you know, controlled environment agriculture, you know, you are controlling the environment, you're controlling what the lettuce or what other products are growing in. And if you, we, we think there's very clear parallels between the vine crop market and what will ultimately happen with lettuce. There's roughly about 75% of say the tomatoes that any of us eat are already grown indoors. In the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a huge transition in North America between you know, Canada, US and Mexico to grow a lot more vine crops indoors to the point where now it's about 75%. And it's really adapting you know, Dutch technology. I mean, they're the Silicon Valley equivalent for what we're all trying to do here in the US and, and they know what they're doing. And I was doing a little bit of math before we started this. If you take just the production of head lettuce, leaf lettuce and everything in California and Arizona to replace that with indoor growing you would need of the highest efficiency dutch systems that produce around half a million pounds a year which is what our facility would produce you'll need about thirty-six thousand acres under glass to reduce the production of california and arizona you know which is just sort of staggering to think and that's across retail food service you know sort of the whole market so that's obviously a, a large number and we're going after today the, the you know five plus billion dollar retail market um as well as food service, which is equally as big, if not larger. And you know, so there is so much kind of room to grow. And we think this is going to be just an inherently better way of how you grow these products. You think about, you know, 15 gallons of water to grow a head of lettuce in California in what is a desert that has huge water issues. You know, you're harvesting either by hand or by machine, triple washing it in the chlorine bath putting it in a package and then driving it to the Midwest or East coast to the point where any of us in New York, Boston, wherever it's a week and a half. If, if things go well, it's a week and a half old. So we've all had the experience of opening up a package, eating half of a salad, coming back the next day and it's wilted and gross, right? That's a lot of food waste. That's, we just don't think that's ultimately the highest and best use for that land, you know, in out there on the West coast. So I, I'm a big believer in the growth of this market as a whole and also the consolidation within it, because my personal belief is the consumer doesn't need 12 hydroponic lettuce staring at them on the retail shelf as they're sitting there. So I think this industry will get a lot larger in the coming years. And then also there'll be a lot of consolidation amongst brands and, and growing styles. So um, that, that I'll, I'll pause there on my diatribe because I could go for a very long time on this, but I think <laughs> there will also be a lot of other technologies that help to go to service that. I mean. We're talking a lot about lettuce, but the indoor growing market as a whole is massive. Floriculture, there's thousands of acres under glass. You know, vine crops, as I just mentioned, 
cannabis and hemp is, you know, obviously a new frontier within that. So for Cirrus, we look kind of across that whole value chain. We just closed an investment in robotic harvesting, which is between strawberries and you don't really need it for lettuce, but strawberries, vine crops, you know, other things like that. That's a 15, $20 billion market. That's looking to replace a lot of the labor, which comes with its own challenges within it. And so, you know, we're, Sorry, on, on this. The lettuce theme, I, I want to stick to lettuce because it's simple to understand. And I, I yep. love the background you both gave on that. And then F, uh, let's talk about pathogen DX on the testing side, which uh, is interesting. The, the other part of disruption that has kind of come up as a theme, Richard, I would love to hear about who we're disrupting. You know, if you could talk about the, the big multinationals that can currently profit from the supply chain and, and you know, kind of how, how that uh, is structured uh, because we had an interesting discussion about that in terms of um, uh, Africa in particular. But if you could chat about that a little bit so we can get a sense of, you know, here's the new technologies that are available, but you know, what exists today is, and, and, and what are the hurdles and, and how would those existing players either just be disrupted out or would start to then do roll-ups, et cetera? I, I think it's a great point. And, and, you know, it depends on what you're, what your goal is, whether you're a, a trader or an investor, I guess is the analogy that I would use. Um, as a former trader who would make hundreds of transactions in a day, if I had guys on my desk that would hold stuff overnight, I'd say, well, I assume you have a call with the CEO tomorrow if you're now an investor, if you're now holding things for a longer period of time. In this development space, there's some times where we need to look at the end result. What is the most efficient solution most likely to be? Is Kroger going to end up having greenhouses on the top of their facilities? Are, are we going to have local grocery stores with containerized food production on the top of their facilities so there is no logistics expense? If that's the case, then do you want to be an outsourced like a Starbucks inside of a, a grocery store and you provide that service with discounted rent and and they buy as they go and the rest is sold into other outside markets or what is the case? Uh, in, in the developing world, though, the, the challenge is that, and, and this is one of those areas that it's important to recognize is we think the big guys are going to come in and solve this problem. Well, the big guys don't need or want to solve the problem, quite frankly. And I'm not going to use specific names, but having spoken with many of them on a regular basis, and some actually serve as advisors to us, um, their, their idea is, if, if for those of you who are close to my age, you remember when Coca-Cola used to trade at $50 bid, $55 offer, literally a 10% spread between the bid and the ask. In sub-Saharan Africa, the disparity between pricing of a local farmer at $180 a ton in Masindi, eight hours away from Kampala, where it's trading at, at $280 a ton, is largely, is largely logistics, but it's largely that no one's come in to, to solve that efficiency problem. And, and that efficiency problem can be solved, but it takes a certain amount of money to come in and do a vertically integrated program. And those entities who have come in and done vertical integration have gone from $10 million in valuation to $2.5 billion of valuation in four years. We're looking to add more people into that mix because a lot of that is logistics. And one of the folks had asked about the challenge of logistics. And in many instances, whether it's for food security in Ethiopia, where we send $800 million in food aid, 62% of the cost is logistics. So in one way, we send food aid to solve the problem because for soy and corn and maize, but in this three months later, we're sending aid to the farmers because they weren't able to sell their crops because we were buying the corn cheaper from subsidized countries like Belgium and Italy and shipping it to them when we could have just paid a little bit more and solved two problems at the same time. So there, there needs to be an intervention where governments recognize what the big problem is and private capital comes in and solves it. I'm a huge believer in, in private organizations solving most of these, these challenges. And if you can come in and build, the, if you can come in with enough size to resolve the vertical challenges where you have some trucks, you contract with farmers, you help provide or produce or, or finance seeds, and you have a guaranteed back end in the marketplace, you can solve that and the returns on investment are fairly significant. Um, I don't know if that answers your question specifically. Yeah, yeah, no. I, yeah, I was gonna say, Richard, I totally agree with you. And you've got to remember where all of us live in the supply chain. So I'm 
super impressed with what you're doing, Eddie, as well, Andrew. You know, you've got to remember, we at the venture side, we're sort of tip up spear, right? We're way upstream. So our job is to find technology, uh, you know, different pieces, if you will, to sort of populate that ecosystem for you, Richard, whether it's logistics tech that we're looking at, whether it's blockchain, AI, whether it's robotics, you know, and you've got to think of us on the venture side, we're five years kind of in front, right? Our job is to stub our toe, lose 90% of our investments, and then 10% return, you know, all of the rest. So if anybody wants to sit in my chair and sweat for a little while, come on down. Because, you know, where else can you lose 90% of your deals and then they expect you to develop, deliver 3x return with the remaining 10? But that being said, when you look at ag tech, uh, you know, we were investing in indoor and vertical farming five to seven years ago. We were investing in logistics supply chain, you know, three to five years ago. Now what we're really focused in on, and this is a great topic because it's around lettuce, is, okay, now we're talking indoor vertical farming. Now we're talking about logistics and supply chain. Where are the missing pieces? Where do we see white space for those investments that we can slide in to create a greater level of efficiency there? And then for us, deliver venture scale returns, right? So that's where we look at things like pathogen testing, because, you know, we believe in indoor ag, we believe in global ag, and the big pro there's a big problem in all of that, which is how do you get it tested and make sure people don't get sick and you don't lose your crops super quick? All right, we've got to solve that. Next question, big problem. How do you decontaminate crops so that they will have longer shelf lives, so that they will not contaminate other crops? How can you do that at small and organic scale? Those are the things that we're zeroing in on right now because I think we see those are, are blockers at making that vision that a Richard or an Eddie or an Andrew have really get to fruition, right? So we're in there as the venture folks saying, okay, we get it. We understand the farm to fork story and we've got to get in there. Now, what I will tell you we're currently investing in is actually even more Star Trekian than what we're talking about here. If you guys think that, you know, lettuce indoors is cool, you should see the stuff we're doing with fermented protein. We are doing a 1 to 1.1 input to output protein ratio right now with one of our companies. I mean, you may have heard about, you know, meat being built in, you know, created in bioreactors. We are creating organic, you know, broad-based amino acid rich perfect proteins at a 1 to 1.1 scale. Just to give you an idea, 1 gram of, you know, traditional, you know, uh, protein from animals can take 40x the inputs that that some of these scale that we're talking about you know and there's a whole chart that starts with cows you know methane output etc ends up with fish and, and aquaculture but at the end of the day you know fermentation and using plant-based protein in that environment is super super interesting so what we'll be talking about on this kind of a call five years to, from today when my beard is all gray is going to be fermentation it's going to be how do we you know, put those bioreactors in cities to grow meat, to grow plant-based proteins. And, you know, like we're talking about now, if you think the billion dollar lettuce industry on the, on the Eastern seaboard is interesting, think about the meat, think about the, 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 you know, animal protein market on the Eastern seaboard. You know, that, that is 5X what the, what, what the salad market is, right? So, you know, we've got, we're trying to get out there and get that bioreactor-based meat protein creation, the plant-based meat uh, protein creation, right? Get that out in front of you folks. And what's interesting is the economics, the scale, and the profit margin are like SaaS level, right? We're talking 60, 70, 80% margins in these businesses. So you want to talk about blowing the doors off. And then when we can get there, you know, to Richard's point, if you can drop a $40 million World Bank supported bioreactor system in Ethiopia, you can feed that entire country with a $50 million plant. One of our companies is working right now with the Gulf because if you might, you know, most of the Gulf countries only produce two things oil and dates. They're using a date weight stream to produce protein that then, you know, the Gulf states can basically gift to the rest of the world, but they're doing it as a, uh, a food security issue. So that's something that, you know, five years from now, we're going to get all Star trek -y on this panel about, you know, fermented beef and, you know, lab-grown chicken. And, you know, I, I mean, your, your, your caviar will be, will be spun up in your kitchen. So it's pretty exciting stuff.
So, so I'm going to start a burger theme here and go from lettuce to, thank you, F, that was uh, very useful. I, I go from lettuce to uh, my favorite uh, uh, Burger King and only item, actually, I think I order from there, which is the Impossible Whopper uh, and, and, you know, um, and uh, having that protein replacement. But I'll, I'll kind of mention that as one example of something that all of a sudden became a thing, right? No, nobody really had heard of it. And then it became, you know, the go-to for a lot of people who want- Oh, wait, 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 wait. Anand, we, we've been slaving away throwing billions of dollars at that problem. And thank yeah. God you said that because otherwise we'd probably never get another dollar to invest out of any LP. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm, I'm not including uh, San Francisco because you guys are ahead uh, in, in the future. So I'm, I'm talking, you know, more more in terms of the, the lay person, uh, but- Isn't it good though? It's, open it's it up. great. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, and, and, and you know, CBD, for example, in the cannabis space, nobody knows the history of how long it took to get that, and but all of a sudden it was a household name, right? Uh, uh, so, so I'd like to open it up to the audience now, and uh, Mark, uh, feel free to also call on people, that, uh, but I'll, I'll open it up for kind of questioning, and then I'll, I'll circle around uh, to talk about the the salvage side or uh, what I call salvage, which is you know the, the waste of food, but. You know, if people people have questions, comments, um, anything to do with what they see happening uh, in terms of where things are shaping up for the future, or what they would like to see, uh, uh, and, and would like to interact with the panelists, uh, please please go ahead. Uh, go ahead, uh, Vijay. I think you've got your hand up there. You're on mute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just sorry, on mute for that. Yeah, a great panel, and it's really exciting to hear what you guys are doing. Um, especially the fact that you're actually putting money into it and kudos to the gentleman who's working with the uh, WFP uh, the World Food Bank. It's quite an interesting initiative. Um, the question is, I've been working uh, with the UN in, in Africa on, on our culture development and food security. One of the greatest issues that we have, one is climate change, the infrastructure, and also, as, as you rightly pointed out, uh, the gate, food gate to market climate change because you know uh, the flooding in west africa can destroy crops uh, the erosion of land destroying crops the road infrastructure i mean a lot of projects we work in south sudan wfp is one of the favorite clients of ours there you know you can grow the crops in the field but by the time it gets to the actual market like the kenyan experience with the milk and the meat is, is another ham dinger so you know the infrastructure needs to be done jointly um and that's it so i'd love to hear your opinions on like you know there needs to be some level of joint funding or some appreciation from the government where you build the roads or you build the food storage facilities in between which can house i mean i know wfp did a big project in south sudan where they went to the farmers and said look if you grow this crop we'll buy it off you but by the time wfp went to the field to collect the crop the seeds weren't good, the crop wasn't good enough. And by the time you got it to the actual market, the crop was destroyed. The other one is diseases. Diseases, diseases are destroying crops. And as much as you can do generic um, seeds and stuff, these are other things that we need to factor into. That can you produce seeds that withstand, you know, um, army, you know, worm armies, which are, which are pretty prevalent in East Africa right now. Anyway, I'll keep quiet. Thank you to everyone, by the way. It was a really good session. Let me let me yeah. take a stab at that. That's okay. Sure, um, you had your hand up too. So yeah, go ahead, Richard. And, and I, I think it's a it's a terrific question, and there are a couple of things that I would say is principles that we abide by. One is that governments are not good at solving those problems. Um, the second is, as a, someone who serves on the board of USAID, for those who don't know USAID, it's the largest check writer for to the UN and the largest check writer for international development. Uh, it's also your tax dollars if you're American. Um, and we have spent, so when we talk about climate uh, change, I, I call it climate volatility for a few different reasons. One is we've had the same problems in Africa for 70 years, um, for at least 40 that I know of. The droughts, the floods, the pests, th this is not new. Uh, we've had them for a long, long time. And the problem is, um, and, and having come from human medicine now into agriculture, the analogy that I make is that the ecosystem or the, uh, it, it, for agriculture is very much like the human system. And I grew up in the South, whereas if a child got sick, they were given an antibiotic. And oftentimes we use very powerful antibiotics 
back in the day, we you, use even worse ones now. And children would get this white, uh, uh, it's called thrush. They would get a white fungus growing on their tongue because the antibiotic killed all of the bacteria and fungus overgrows in their body. That happens to us. There's a balance between fungus and bacteria and virus. And the same thing exists in the soil. And when you kill off certain parts of bacteria with chemicals that are not appropriate for the soil, or you have fungal overgrowth. And one of the things that we've done over the past four years, we've tried not to make it terribly public, but we've been putting pressure on uh, countries on a regular basis. And I'm actually have an article that's almost complete. that will be out probably this week. That's an open letter to leaders of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, in, in Uganda, Rwanda, Kenya, Tanzania, Malawi, parts of Sudan, and Ethiopia, they have 300% of the incidence of atypical pediatric cancer, 300%. They have 300% the incidence of hepatic or liver cancer in those countries. If we had that in New York, we had a 10% increase in liver cancers, it would be on national news. If we had it in several states, it would be a pandemic. In Sub-Saharan Africa, they've had it going on and on and on for years and years. And it's caused by aflatoxin, which those in ag know aflatoxin. Aflatoxin is caused by improper farming techniques, not good management of the soil, sure. not good management of irrigation or post-harvest management. So the reason that the media company was so important for us is that now we can get out to millions and millions of people good agricultural practices. We can incentivize them. But to the, the points that Ephraim was making earlier as well, is we have all these great technologies and we've seen this time and time again, not just from entrepreneurs in the US, but it's even harder in Africa. You know, these African farmers come and say, or entrepreneurs say, look, every time we start a business, we just can't get distribution. It just doesn't seem to fail. You know, four out of five companies fail. And we say, well, welcome to being an entrepreneur. It's not much different in the United States or Europe either. New companies are tough to get going. And, and what we try to get them to do is to focus on what is successful in new launches, which are franchises. The reason franchises work is because they have established systems in place. They have systems for dealing with clients, for sourcing their inputs, for managing issues, for managing finances. And that efficiency is where they're able to make money versus those people who are just doing it off the cuff. So for us, the media platform gives us the ability now to take all these new technologies and reach millions of people with better seeds, better fertilizers, new technologies. We had a group talk to us the other day about Pangambia uh, trees, for those who are, are familiar. Per acre, 40X amount of the protein of soybean. Um, that's incredible. We want to hear about it. And we want to test it. And if we can test in a few areas, next year you'll see it on TV. And we'll have uh, farmers. Right. Hemp. R Richard, we got to get you hemp no. because you know that right. that that's a double stack crop, right? That's fiber and energy production coupled with protein Oils. production. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. All in the same bucket. I mean, I, you know, the, I agree. Yeah. The thing that we're looking at on the Silicon Valley side, and you know, I put on my family foundation hat here for a minute because we are our own foundation and family office. You know, uh, I guess one of the things that we're grappling with right now, you know, and is uh, you know. Why is, why is the amount of capital being thrown at the traditional broken system in Africa today, right? In our mind, if you were to take a fraction of the, of the aid dollars that were going into sub-Saharan Africa and built fermentation plants today that, you know, at $50 million a pop, that's, that's not that meaningful. The raw tonnage of protein that they could produce uh, you know, as a protein powder that, you know, frankly, you know, is, is good enough to go in Impossible Burgers, but could be equally produced to, to feed that uh, entire country um, is shocking. I mean, you know, to us in Silicon Valley, you know, one of the things that I, I grapple with my family office friends and, and foundation friends on all the time is, you know, is it, do we have to go with that biblical teach people to fish and they will eat for a lifetime thing? Or, or is this really like, we just need to like, you know, clear the table drop in fermentation and other high scale plants, let the folks that are going to actually do agriculture do something like you're talking about, either high value energy crops, something else that they're not relying upon as, as their 100% food source, right? Uh, you know, produce a high yield solar based fermentation model that's, that's just gonna turn out tons and tons and tons of protein and, and you know, focus them on creating their input stream for those plants, which, you know, again, disease doesn't matter because it's very fermented and all these other issues. So, you know, I think that's what we grapple with is, you know, when are we going to kind of flip the switch and say, you know what, 
let's stop driving out on a dirt road with, you know, bad seed and, and all this other stuff and just drop in these, these, you know, kind of Star Trekian facilities. It will just, you know, end the story on the hunger health in a healthy way. Now, if I, I, I agree with you, but I, I would add that there is a process. Well, there's the good and the bad. The good is there's an opportunity for many of these countries to leapfrog just like they did in the cell phone system, right? There's no need to lay landlines when we can just go to cell towers. There's also an opportunity for these countries to make massive increases in their production per hectare uh, by taking on new crops like cannabis and, and other things. But they're not going to go straight to the, the facilities because you have millions of people with no jobs. And, it just, and if, you, if you build the facility, you're still going to have millions of people that can't buy the protein because they have no jobs. So there needs to be that piece in between. But, but the point of it is, is you have to expect that. In 10 years, those can be there. But we've got to start getting them to grow the crops that could support that or be ancillary to it because you're not going to make things just out of the protein. Uh, and, and there's, you know, from the medical side, there's a lot of studies that, sh that show that, you know, protein is an important building, kind of like milk, right? You don't necessarily need milk when you get older. Protein demand actually goes down, but we do need a breadth of all the other minerals and vitamins and what have you. So we do need fruits and vegetables and these other things in addition. And as they grow, as you know, 800 million, even if all 800 million were farmers, once they learn better practices, they'll go to being 100 million farmers because they'll I sell agree. their stuff off and they'll move into the manufacturing and processing. But we've got to give them that stepping stone to get to the next level. So the question are, what are the best stepping stones, which is why I said earlier, what are the ones that will prepare them for 10 years from now where the preponderance of protein is made that way, right? What are the other things that will be ancillary or supportive of that? Richard, yeah, that makes Rob, sense. Rob Colorini, you have a question? Hey, thanks, Mark. Thanks, Anand. Just a quick question. Um, the, uh, this is a little bit more macro or, or policy-wise. I, I, I like what you guys are talking about. It's fantastic, you know, from the international and, and the, uh, uh, the efficiency. However, you know, if, if you go to, you know, the Tenderloin in San Francisco or, or parts of New York City, you know, you got clear homelessness, you've got, you know, a, a, a bad nourishment and the like. And, you know, there is this, you know, huge divide still. And I think some of the arguments from the U.S. policymaker side is, or even the USLP side is, you know, we got problems in our, in our own backyard. How do you all uh, intend to put resources and some of this brain power you know, towards improving that, uh, that system domestically? Before folks even, um, um, you know, can consider alpha abroad. So that's 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 sort of the what's on my mind. Can I? I can. I'll share one quick concept with you that I shared with the group prior. Domestically, we run an organization called the Global Food Exchange. We've actually partnered with the Black Mayors Conference and with uh, the uh, National Governors Association to to put out a program where we're actually as World Food Bank, our our strategy or our catalyzing technology is taking food and drying it. So that it and storing it in a way that we can hold it for decades. We actually are trying to take a model where we can go to all the, the strawberry growers, for example, in California and the peach growers in Georgia and take their number twos or their fruit that's too ripe to be purchased by Kroger or Publix. I'll take that and they'll sell it to me at 25 to 45 cents on the dollar. I'll take it, slice it, dry it, and bag it. And then I take that and put it into the system for USDA to go into the uh, the breakfast and lunch feeding programs for students, which right now, as you know, we have somewhere between 16 and 22 million students a day. If they're on the, if they're on the free lunch program, about 80% of them, that's their only meal for the day. And so they're at a distinct disadvantage. For about 15 cents, we can give them a highly fortified protein, 26 minerals and vitamins cereal that also has these added fruits and the lunches that have these added vegetables that have taken care of much of the waste from the farms in uh, around the U.S. So that's one way you can take those things that are just getting ready to go to no good. Part of it can go into the food bank system. Part of it can go into, because there's enough to do more than that. And part of it can go into being salvaged by being dried, packaged. And you use the technologies like F was talking about. You put it through a cleaning process, whether it's a CLO2 or a, a or one of the other ozone. ozone treatments and it's a very safe methodology and in many ways those strawberries and those peaches are at their peak of ripeness right then right that's when they're absolutely the best so i don't mind taking them and cutting them up and drying them this, yeah. that, that's just one potential solution that's a great one thank you so i i think hemp came up uh and there's someone on the call that are focused on on hemp uh vlad in particular you want to maybe make a comment sure. 
Yeah, thanks, Mark. I uh, really like what I'm hearing and especially excited that uh, finally hearing a lot about hemp. You know, thanks, Richard. Uh, thanks, F. Uh, definitely like what you hear because a lot of what I heard really parallels uh, this, the same journey we're on uh, with hemp, uh, industrial hemp, and uh, you know, a, a long journey uh, with some of the colleagues that brought me in uh, with Root Origins and what's now HMP, which is a new Ohio uh, co-op, uh, but still has some national reach. Um, you know, from a root origins or HMP aspect, and because this is ag tech, just, you know, wanted to touch on that. Um, you know, I'm coming at this uh, from a compliance standpoint. Uh, we're working very heavily on the R&D side around testing. Uh, also, and uh, with our alliance and compliance, where we're working alongside uh, a group out of Texas, uh, where we've been kind of hand in hand with them uh, on developing uh, a compliance uh, app, uh, in, and it's called Hempliance. Um, it's, it's built in blockchain, uh, basically it tracks everything from seed to shelf, everything from genetics to GPS coordinates, everything from lab test results, et cetera, all the way through the supply chain. And maybe, the maybe, maybe yeah. we, we know you're deep in the space. What, do you, what are you seeing and how can we help on the, on the well, hemp side? Well, education is gonna be a big part of this. I mean, there's still a lot of confusion around cannabis, hemp mm -hmm. and, you know, now with the 2018 Farm Bill, Ohio's entering into its second grow season now, uh, there's a lot uh, from the compliance standpoint as well uh, that we're taking on around testing, uh, greater uh, transparency. Uh, I like what F is talking about and some others here that they're putting some capital in that space. Uh, we're also involved in indoor grow and greenhouse. Um, you know, we're taking this obviously here into Ohio as well. We've been doing a lot out west, out in Oregon, Northern California. So from our standpoint, you know, the more people that we can get involved in bringing hemp to the forefront, um, and that's not just from CBD and cannabinoids and, and the other aspects, but uh, it, it's also on the industrial uses and some of the things that we're doing from an R&D perspective you know, around hemp plastics, uh, around other building materials, uh, replacement materials, uh, a lot of conversation around sustainability. So, um, so Bud, maybe we could just, because I want to keep it open, open it up. Um, maybe we should do a hemp deep dive then. Yeah, and then, no, absolutely. I mean, I think it's, it's uh, definitely needed. Yeah. Vlad, get in touch with us because there are about 10 other companies building that tech happy to share what we see. You know, they come to us for investment, happy to share that with you. Uh, right. You know, maybe there's someone you can buy and partner with to collapse your cycle time there. I, I have heard uh, through the grapevine, you guys are already talking to Front Range Biosciences to uh, to get a hold of some of their genetics to grow in Ohio. If you like okay. me to make a top level executive introduction for you personally, the CEO, just reach out. Uh, we'll make that happen and get you top of the top of the stack. Uh, as I mentioned, they've, they've, they've got the largest bioinformatic database in the world. So if you want to do something with genetics, go talk to them and I'll, I'll, I'll make all that happen for you as well. No, I appreciate that. And I, I think, Mark, I think Scott's on as well. I, uh, Scott's our CEO. Yeah, yeah, Scott's got his hand up. Go, go ahead, Scott. Yep. Yeah, Thank hi, guys. Th th thanks again. Yeah. Thanks, Vlad. I, I think Vlad covered a lot of the issues that we're, we're trying to face with the ag tech side of it being fused through blockchain to you know, ID uh, opportunities for farmers. And that's really kind of what ties into the second part that I wanted to address and it was touched on briefly, uh, which is you know, the, the value to communities, the actual value to farmers, the, the end result of all of our efforts at, at such high levels to, you know, to make uh, you know, access and opportunity through, through capital. But the, uh, the other side of the coin is entrepreneurship and workforce development. And we're in partnership with a, a nonprofit based in Youngstown, Ohio, and are, are seeking to uh, round up a, a research pilot uh, between four state universities uh, toward identifying uh, the sweet spot between available uh, farm uh, uh, fields, fallow fields uh, in particular, uh, and uh, industrial capacity 
within that region and, and thereby patching together what would kind of look like a quilt of regional centers of excellence. This is the strategy that our, that our plan really complements uh, with the sustainable community, uh, sustainable communities framework. And we're excited about it. So anybody that has, you know, space and research uh, and, and F, as you described, uh, this, you know, a database potentially could come in very handy. We're very interested to, to talk it up with you. Oh, so, can I, I read that? Just not real quick. Sorry, go ahead. Scott, I was just going to say, I, as part of my work at the board of USAID, uh, we're working to expand the number of what they call innovation labs, which are university sponsored uh, projects and programs. And they have a soy lab of, of legumes lab and what have you. But I would, I would suggest that you either reach out to them or I'd be happy to make connections for you. And if you can find partner universities, that would be a great, great way for you to, to really get some impact behind that if you want. Yeah. And no, absolutely. We really appreciate that. And Mark, just, you know, plug for Ohio as well. I mean, there's significant. I'll, I'll, I'll plug Ohio. So it was a year ago. Um, <laughs> I'm, from, I'm from Ohio. So a year ago, we met with Senator, uh, the, Lieutenant Governor John Husted, who just came out of uh, Governor DeWine, and they shut down the Arnold or the uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger annual event. Uh, that was one of the first, you know, signs that this is, uh, this shit is real right, uh, COVID. And, um, but we're gonna go back to Ohio. We're, we were there to talk about a three-day event in Ohio. So we've got a lot of connectivity to, and the governor's got a, you know, a couple hundred million that he can back. You know, they take liquor sales tax and invest in an in industry to help jobs, help jobs Ohio. So we'll, we'll be back in Ohio in a big way. Uh, yeah. Zach, you wanna shed light from, the, from Dubai? Um, thanks, Mark. I just had a question for uh, Richard. Um, so the, the point you made of 62% of the funds going to logistics and the grain being bought from Europe, uh, how much is that of that is political? Like, can it actually be changed or is it just like political? You, you want to buy from Europe, you know, like uh, reserve price and whatnot. And uh, sure. a quick plug, because a lot of data points were mentioned in terms of like uh, forecasts and whatnot. Uh, I was going to plug Grow Intelligent, um, which is like a data platform we invested in four years ago. It's a mature company at this point. I think it's good for anyone in agriculture. Richard, I think, recognizes this as well. Um, so people managing farms and whatnot, it's like forecasting and data. It's great information and things are changing. And I think, uh, like Vlad was saying, there's a, there's a need for everyone to kind of increase the noise level around these things. But um, about, you know, some portion of that is because the, the people that are leading the efforts with AID are European, and so they're trying to help their home countries. Uh, but the other part of it, and this is where I've spent a lot of time with the World Food Program and others discussing, is saying, you know, why is it you buy from these countries when you know that it's subsidized and it's below market? They're selling it at a loss. And they said, well, you know, the U.S. does the same thing, and many other countries do the same thing. And because these subsidies are hidden, they're not direct, right? Sometimes it's a discount on taxes. Sometimes it's land. Uh, uh, it's um, you know uh, you get a you get a value back for for a, uh, land improvements. It's a tax savings. It's a whatever. And because there's it's too difficult to figure out where the actual subsidy of the source comes from. In some countries, it's very blatant. If you grow corn, we'll give you fifty dollars a ton and towards that effort or whatever the case may be. So what they said is we've gotten, we got too frustrated figuring it out. So we just buy from whoever has the cheapest. Now, over the past four years or so, there, there's actually been a turn in the boat to say, you're gonna start giving preferential treatment to those host countries. So if you can buy the commodity in country, you should buy it. The challenge we have now is in places like Ethiopia in Uganda, Rwanda, Kenya, and other places, with the exception of maybe parts of Nigeria, maybe parts of South Africa, the preponderance of what they grow, and this is a technical term because I'm from Georgia, is it's crap. It's really poor quality. And they won't buy it because their brand is on it. So if they buy maize and send it off and it has a, it has a bacteria or a fungus on it, people are going to say, you know, World Food Program doesn't care about children. They're killing children by giving them poor quality food. So they only buy what meets the standards. Well, now we've got to go to the next step, which is increase the quality of what they grow. And uh, so I don't know if that answers your question specifically, but the tide is turning, but we still need to keep it moving. Uh, yes, thanks. That means, yeah, things are changing. They are, yeah. They're changing actually fairly rapidly, but we have so, to keep the pressure on. So you mentioned university research programs, centers of excellence. I see Mark White's got his hand up because uh, he deals with Big Ten 
universities in the Midwest. Go, go ahead, Mark. You're on mute, though. I thought you're gonna you're gonna like take a slap at F for talking about Silicon Valley versus uh, the Midwest, but I'll. Well, no, I actually agree with F that uh, you know we you know just as a way of introduction, Prairie Crest Capital is an early stage uh, ag, ag tech uh, venture capital firm, and we also do a couple of other verticals. But you know we do an essential part of our investment strategy is we we find the companies at early stage in the middle of the country, and we partner with Silicon Valley firms because uh, we. we right. We can't get the scalability without that expertise and money. He gets, so, he gets but, the same digit uh, valuations, though. He, well, the company, you know, the reality is it's an it's economic logic is that, you know, the companies do need relative, particularly life science companies do need relatively high valuations and the business propositions and the value propositions have to support those high valuations. Or else, you, 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 if you look through the funding cycle, it just never kind of works out, right? Um, but Richard, uh, you know, I had a I had a question for you on, uh, and this is directed at F as well, because I have done some uh, at least research work in Uganda and Ghana, and work a little bit with self help. I don't know if you've heard of them, Richard, but uh, you know, the, the, my my conclusion, and we were thinking of launching an African agricultural fund at one point. My, my conclusion was that the real issue is both the what you said the inputs to the market, but getting things from the farm to the market has been a perpetual challenge throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. So I like the idea of a technological leapfrog, but with a, mostly small plot farmers and the industrial farming in the middle of the, the African continent has kind of been abandoned uh, a generation, a couple of generations ago. There, that technological leap has to happen on multiple levels to solve that. So we came up with a hypothesis of mostly about technology transfer, which is the technological leap, and uh, financing. And we needed to get local people involved rather than U.S. companies or uh, you know foreign companies drop trying to drop in something that was vertically integrated because that's proven to be a very difficult strategy too. So I just yeah. like your reaction to that. How do you solve these multiple problems? What's the conception to drop something in that we transform that incentive to grow, which is the ability to get to market. Uh, uh, Mark, there's a, the, before yeah. we on that, I know F has to hop. Uh, so before we answer that with Rich, I uh, just wanted to thank F. And if you have final words uh, before you have to hop, F, go ahead. Yeah, no, thank you. It's been great. You know, phenomenal group of folks here, uh, you know, uh, you know, would love to uh, come back, spend some time. You know, you could just tell that the brain power is off the charts across it. My colleagues on the panel, thank you so much. Really great input. Mark, uh, you know, keep funding Ohio. They're great deals all around the country. Richard, you need to find a pool of venture capital advanced research money from AID and everybody else because I've seen companies that have, have got tons of solves for all those pest problems and so on that, that you know, never can get out of that seed stage because big ag in the U.S. and in the developing countries you know, don't have the scale for them. So that's an important part. If anybody wants to get in touch, uh, you know, I posted some of my info on the chat there. Mark can uh, you know, get folks in touch and, and welcome the opportunity to come back. Really impressive group and uh, everybody be safe out there. Thank you. Thanks, so take, take care now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, Richard. You were you were going to address Mark's uh, question. Uh, Mark, yeah, great points. And I think again, one of the and, and we spent and by we I mean I've I've written you know we we spent millions of dollars into that same effort and we've spent a uh, it's been a very um, it's been a very expensive course of education over the past number of years. But a lot of it, just like trading, you can't learn it the way you need to unless you do it yourself. And uh, so we I, I do see a lot of those problems that you're talking about. One of the things. Um, that we found, though, is if you're going to get broad scale information out to people, I think that um, AID and a lot of other organizations have been, while, while good intentions, have not been the most efficient, which is the way that governments normally do things. They, they've gone out and treated what we would call in the biblical sense, the least of these. The person that has one acre, in fact, there's organizations like the One Acre Fund that go and work with farmers with very, very small pieces of land to teach them better practices using better inputs and aggregating that together as a cooperative to take it to market. The problem that you have is that it takes a long, long time to get those farmers integrated for one. And I did a TED talk on this at one point. There's a, uh, 
you know, there's a, a, an old Socratic saying that, that you know, f um, for those who have everything to lose, uh, risk is necessarily, well, what's the, what's the term that they use? Is uh, um, the, 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 all of the analogy, I'll, I'll use a simple analogy. If we, if, if we, have, a, if we have a competition or a, 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 a ticket that you can win a lottery and it costs $10 and you can win 10 times your money and you have an 80% chance of winning, how many people on this panel would buy that ticket? Everybody would buy the 10. It's $1,000. A thousand dollar ticket, you have an 80% likelihood you're going to win 10 times your money. How many people would buy the ticket? But what if it was five million dollars? And if you don't have the five million, I'll take your goats, your chicken, your cows, your children, your land as collateral. How many people now would buy that ticket when everything is bet on that? And that's kind of what you're asking the small hold farmer to do. You're asking them every time to bet everything. And they can't afford to do that. So where we found that the real impact happened is by changing the minds and the practices of people that are already in the cash economy, the people with five or 10 or 20 acres first, that's what TV does. So by TV programming and radio programming and the radio program is to the people with one acre and two acres and five acres, the TV program reaches people with five and 10 and 20. When they see that success of their neighbor with a little bit larger land for a season or two, then they will adopt those practices. So it needs to be pushed down from the cash economy down further. The other thing we found out is that if you have, there's a, the same thing we see here. People believe what they see on TV. I know it's true. I read it on the internet. That, that same thing exists all over the world. When people watch it on TV, they believe it better than, quite frankly, a PhD from Iowa State or from even from the University of Ohio. They will trust, you know, Magwanga from Kasumu because she's in the same place as they are and they will believe her and they'll follow her. If she can do it, then they can do it. And so on the TV program, for example, we had a, a stove that was a high efficiency, low fuel stove, uses 90% less wood than other stoves. Also a big problem in East Africa, cutting down too many trees, burning too much wood, what have you. They had sold 1200 stoves in the prior year. They had won numerous awards for the quality and design, but they couldn't get distribution. They, were, they won a $60,000 uh, competition. They put that money into being sponsored on Shamba Shepa. So we featured them on the show as, as part of the programming. They sold 30,000 units in the next 90 days. And this is an $87 stove selling into a market where people's average income is $2 a day. So the reason that the, one of the things I wanted to, to share with folks as a take home message is that when you have great technologies and great science and great research and all of this stuff, we need to get it on platforms like Medii to get it out there. So it's a, if you're having trouble with distribution of a great idea, you should talk to us about it. Whether you want to invest in Medii or not, we can certainly help take you to the next level with that. So I, does that help answer some of it, Mark? Yeah, I think, you know, it, you know the, the model we came up with and never executed was that, you know, it, much like in the development of China, it, I spent a lot of time in China during its whole evolution. Uh, from, you know, the liberalization in the liberalization of the economy is that we need to have a much more aggressive effort to technology transfer and making that technology available and funding the entrepreneurs. Because, you know, just to illustrate what you're saying, Richard, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a medium, uh, you know, a medium scale uh, holder in Uganda, for instance, which I think the average farmer has about 40 hectares or something like that. And that's why we focused on Uganda. It's still, you know, their farm to market, like we have these, this wonderful farm to market system that's we consider antiquated in the United States, right? But the way they, the way they, the way they grow food for other people rather than subsistence is they grow it and they wait for a truck to come at some time. They don't know when it's coming and they don't know at what price they're getting. It's that fundamental that there's, you know, doesn't have the infrastructure of, of the currency of trust or right. predictability or reliability. So it's really tough for even a medium holder you know, to grow food for other people that go to a market without that reliability of being able to get a predictable market price or, you know, so maybe offtake agreements and things like that. But I, I, we, we became committed that we needed to fund local people to right. do that and educate them and just provide the money. And it, you have to look at it kind of like a venture portfolio. Yeah. That's, that's, that was our viewpoint. When we well, you're exactly right. And, and there's a, there are a couple of things. And the trust component, I think you hit it on the head. The trust component is the biggest piece. So, for example, we trained 4,000 farmers 
on better growing strategies and techniques, soil management, seed, fertilizer, irrigation, everything. Um, and we came back and trained him at the beginning of the season, the middle of the season, SMS message him. And we say, well, we're going to be coming by your crops. We have satellite based weather systems. We send them weather data specific to their GPS, specific to their crop. And we say, we'll be by on Friday. You should be harvesting on Thursday. And we show up on Friday and two thirds of them had already sold their crop because someone else had come in from Sudan and paid them. And we said, well, you know, we guaranteed you 220 a ton. If that wasn't the right price, you should have called us or text us. And they said, no, I didn't. I sold it for less, but I sold it yesterday. Someone brought me cash yesterday. They will sell it just like you said, Mark. They'll sell it to the first person that brings them cash. And they literally took a 15% haircut just to have cash the day before. But by going back season after season, the goal for World Food Bank and combining that with our media platform and all of this is that we'll have that relationship. And in those areas where we've been there for several seasons, we do have that relationship. But it takes a while. It doesn't just happen overnight. You can't just plug some technology in and resolve it. There is a relational component that it takes on the ground with folks. So well, I, the technology just, allows us to do that quicker. I just say one other thing. As a venture investor, there's a lot of technologies here in the U.S. that are at their, at their infancy, the stage of infancy. They're, they're you know, pre-revenue or they're, or, or they're a modest level of revenue. You know, I think if someone were to put together a platform, and it, and it may be someone from the NGO world that could transfer that technology and it would be a great place for those technologies to be deployed, tested, and for people to get validation uh, in, in Africa. But the te technology transfer piece is important too. But I'll, I'll leave that alone. because well, I, I think you're exact. We actually see, we actually, for those of you who are, are familiar with, I don't know any, probably nobody on this show watches, on this program watches it, but uh, we kind of see our, see ourselves as the QVC model right bring if you remember watching if you ever watch shark tank with the gal that's on there from qvc and she says i'll take your pro i'll buy i'll invest in your product because i'm going to turn around and put it on qvc and we'll sell a million units that's kind of what we're hoping we'll be able to do now that we're adding three million viewers a year that we'll be able to partner with other places give them discounted advertising and maybe take a piece of the ticket or ec or buy equity or whatever and then force them to be successful by giving them the distribution they need other comments, thoughts? Uh, well, one other aspect that we were kind of chatting about as we were prepping for this event, uh, and I think, uh, uh, Liabim, you're, you're on there, is uh, what I call it salvage or, or how to not waste uh, produce and, and the, the kind of scope of that problem. Uh, I'm not sure if your, your um, connection is on, uh, Liabim, but... Yes, yes, Matt is actually participating. Okay, great, Matt. Uh, welcome. Uh, would love to get a framing of that. I think it's a it's another key aspect, and uh, uh, would love to get kind of some some data points on that so that we can we can have some questions around it. Um. Yeah, and I I hadn't realized I was going to be given. Uh, but yeah, anyway, basically, obviously, as you know, food waste is a ma massive issue. The um, UNEP came out last week with a new report in collaboration with a British institution called RAP. Uh, a billion tons of food goes to waste uh, across the year. Um, the idea, you know, I mean, essentially it's, you got food loss from the farm up to retail, but not including retail. And then you've got massive food waste from retail, food service and consumer. Um, but yeah, I don't really have that much to say on that right now. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a massive, massive topic. And, and it's interesting, we do talk about Sub-Saharan Africa, and obviously I've learned so much tonight from, from you all. But um, the amount of food we waste today, which is between 25% and 50%, depending on who you, who you uh, read up on, um, that quantity of food is four times the amount of food insecure, severe food insecure people. So, um, so yes, we need new tech, we need, uh, we need to transfer the technology, but also, you know, we've got some low hanging fruit that desperately needs sorting. So, um, so anyways, that's kind of what I look at. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm not that prepared, but that's no, what I focus on, on in Denmark. Yeah, and, and then let, let me just jump, jump in um, to, to clear the air somewhat, because if, if you remember, we were planning at the planning session yesterday, we decided Matt would not be uh, delivering any presentation today. So I really, I really wanted him to just dial in and sit and absorb uh, the discussions we were having. 
And I do hope, and I actually, we need a separate deep dive specifically focusing on the issue of food waste, because to me, it's appalling. Um, uh, just as, as someone, um, uh, let me put it this way, why I personally take this close to heart. I am a Ukrainian, so if any of you ever uh, looked on the tangent into the Ukraine history, you would know that uh, uh, my people suffered a horrible, horrible famine, which is called Holdemore, um, in 1932-1933, where six million people were basically killed uh, by the Soviet regime through starvation. Therefore, in Ukrainian families, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's virtually unthinkable of disposing the food from your table. And so when um, I saw um, for the first time what Matt was doing, <coughs> and it's a, <laughs> it's a pretty peculiar method of attracting attention to the food wastage. And when he shared some numbers um, and the dynamics um, of how much food is weighted, oh, wasted through, throughout the value chain, and more specifically at the supermarkets level, I found that completely appalling and disgusting. And I think this is one of the issues we do need to address. But this is also a very complex issue, just like anything and everything we have discussed today on this topic of food security and advancements in uh, food access, um, nutrition access in, in the world. It's a very complex system. Uh, likewise, the food wastage is a very complex problem. So there are no easy solutions or there are no snap of the fingers uh, solutions available. Um, and therefore, I do think that it's, 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 it's very important to have a separate discussion on that. And if, uh, uh, if we could build uh, uh, that kind of deep dive in the coming couple sure. of months, I don't know, uh, depending on the schedule, uh, Matt could uh, come in and deliver his uh, presentation. I saw one of his presentations, it's very impactful and eye-opening, and then I'm sure um, a lot of other members can uh, or could contribute uh, so, to that uh, debate or discussion. So absolutely, Lubim. And Matt, you'll see on the, we have every Wednesday, although frankly, if you ask a lot of people, just any time, come to the Zoom, we're here. Uh, but on Wednesdays, we get into breakouts and we get these events planned. And um, so that, you know, if you, to the extent that you, you are Lubim and others, I would just ask as we do this, if we also find way, uh, solutions that are maybe investment opportunities to solve this uh, as part of that equation. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it to the, to the village to, to decide. Mark, yeah, you have yeah, your hand up. Sorry, go ahead, Matt. So yeah, I, obviously I just, I didn't explain what I do. Yeah, basically uh, supermarket dumpsters are freely accessible here, unlike many countries. So food waste is a very unsexy topic to report on in the media or for people to get interested. So what I did, I went to those supermarket dumpsters and brought back all the food to my house by bicycle because I can't drive and took photos uh, in artistic fashion. And so you come across sometimes, you know, 100 kilos of beef that's been unsold because, you know, the discount wasn't good enough and in, in good time, the date goes, boom, throw it all out. So that's kind of the method I use. And then I use social media networks, LinkedIn, Instagram. So yeah, that was the idea. But we can talk about it another time. Yeah, but yeah there's not so much investment opportunities. I think that's just supermarkets, economics, getting it wrong, basically. Well, you can, you, you well, the different ways to play that theme, uh, you can, uh, in addition to exposing it, you know, the fourth rail of uh, journalism or social media journalism. Um, Mark. Yeah, just a couple of notes. I think, uh, and I'm not, I'm going to mispronounce her name, Libium. Libium. Libium, uh, yes. Lubeam. I was just talking, yeah. Yeah, I think you touched on something that's really an underappreciated social impact part of agricultural investing, which is nutritional equity. And that goes across the broad spectrum of topics, right? We yeah. have it here in the US, my hometown of Detroit, uh, up until two, three years ago, he had no grocery stores in a city of 700,000 people. 
right? And now he has, then they had one, which was right on the city border, okay, with the northern suburbs, it was a Whole Foods. You know, Whole Foods doesn't exactly address the nutritional uh, inequities within the city of Detroit that people have to commute there for, for eight or 10 miles and, and don't have the budget for Whole Foods. Right. So nutritional equity and accessibility and affordability is a very important part of that. And Matt, you know, in, in, you know, I don't, I don't know what action you're taking on the food waste side, but I'm sure you're familiar with the organization called Refed. And in the 2019 Techstars Farm to Fork uh, cohort, there were a couple of food waste companies. I forget their name, but, uh, you know, so there are people that are trying to commercialize efforts around, uh, you know, and addressing addressing the food waste problem, but it's still way under uh, addressed. It's a supply chain problem that Andrew was focused on and it's packaging to increase shelf life. It's genetics to increase shelf life. There are people working on that. There's a gentleman named Jack, Jerry Vidalston that's working on that. And if you want to integrate with all those people and uh, connect with them, just feel free to reach out to me. And I'd like to invite my friend, uh, you see on the screen, Nick Covey, who's at Kroger's, who we talk about this, this aspect. I think I was talking to you about, Rich, about him, Rich, Richard. Um, he's, he, I, he's the kind of guy, by the way, his, his roommate was uh, Alex Moffat, who's on Sac is our Saturday Night Live. If I could get actually Nick in, Alex Moffat would be really nice. Um, but Nick would, Nick's trying to invest in things, but he has the ear of the CEO Kroger's too, but as you said, it's, it's a complex thing, but let's bring others into the table, around the table. Mark, I was, I was literally going to, I just spoke with Nick yesterday and that's oh, what I was gonna, yeah, I was going to share that with you. Oh, um, one of the challenges that we had, and we were talking to them about saying, look, if I could create in Denver, Colorado or Cincinnati, Ohio, um, or Chicago, some of the areas that are target areas, if we could create a drying facility in the north, east, west, south that could aggregate your leftovers and we could partner with groups like Feeding America and what have you, would that help? And their biggest concerns are really twofold. One is, do we have to manage any of the logistics? Because it's already food we're throwing away. Now we don't have to pay to throw it away. Mm -hmm. And so if we're able to come in and buy it and dry it and pay them for it, which is the way we, we would do here in the U.S., that actually adds additional value. The, mm -hmm. other, the other side though, and this is where this organization, this group might be a big help, is that there's a liability issue, right? You have groups like Panera for years were giving away their day old bread. They would keep it for one day. And if it didn't sell, they would put it in big separate bags and put it outside and food banks and others would pick it up. Mm -hmm. And somebody somewhere sued them and sued other companies for saying, well, it was bad, it had a fungus, it had a whatever. whatever. And so now all these restaurants all across the country no longer hand out food because some idiot um, sued somebody and now they don't want the liability or their insurance goes through the roof. So in, in medicine, we have a, a law uh, called the Good Samaritan's Law, right? If you stop on the side of the road and you have basic life support training and there's a fire in the car and you pull somebody out because they're stuck in the car and you didn't know they had a broken back and you cause additional injury, you're not suable by that. You're removed of a large portion of liability because you were doing what you thought was best to solve a problem that was emergent. We need to have the same kind of law for food. I got you. Well, to, I want to get to the Eddie and Joe, but, but is that organic, Nick Covey, or did you hear? Oh, no, uh, that's because you told me and I connected on, on uh, LinkedIn and he said, and I told him I spoke with you and he said, I would love to chat with you. Let's talk. And it just so happened that, was was that? yesterday All afternoon. Right. So yeah, thank, thanks to that. you. I love that. Okay, cool. Eddie, question? You know, so it's, it's a more, I think to Matt's point and to a couple other points about Richard's point about food waste, it's, it's sometimes it doesn't have to be that difficult. Uh, a classmate of mine from Stanford uh, a couple of years ago started a, a now really big app called Olio. Uh, in the UK, and it essentially does, um, you know, about 33% to 50% of the, of, the, of the food never gets eaten. Uh, and so it essentially is an app that you can download. And if you have food left over, you can sort of make a picture of it, upload on your app and say, and make your location known as I've got food left over, consumer to consumer. Oh, yeah. uh, and, and it's very big in the UK right now. And it's, it's, it's you know, soon in a town near you. Um, but it's an, it's an excellent way to essentially not get, go good food to waste. How many of us have, after a big meal, have half of that meal left, whether it's ordering or make? 
Uh, and so it's a, um, it's a really interesting, fairly simple um, app that connects people and that re dramatically reduces food waste. This is it right here, Olio? O-L-I-O. -O. You notice that our, yeah, that's our, it. World, our world, okay. Thanks. That's it. All right, Joe? You. There you go. Yeah, I, I think uh, Richard brought up a great point about partnering, but P that, that's such a foreign concept. I mean, we, we all talk about it, but it's such a foreign concept to a lot of organizations and, and they just don't know how to do it. And, you know, I just, I, I, I want to raise this, people's attention to it because you know you look at what what the virus has done it's it's crippled a lot of our you know different parts of our economy and we don't know how to to deal with it and and we're so focused on making money we forget on how to um actually you know partner with an organization and what that means so that's that's all i just want to make that comment i think it was a great comment Well, hopefully, hopefully not this crowd. Not this crowd. Yeah. I'd also draw your draw attention to Matt Homewood copied the article, and I thought that this had been had uh, gone by the wayside. But but um, but Matt was talking about there is they do have a food security act that was done in 1996, and actually that's the reason groups like Feeding America are actually able to take large donate Kroger donates to Feeding America, and that's how they're protected from that. Um, but the smaller companies, I thought there were other issues and that there were holes in it. And actually it was the CEO of Panera that shared that with me. So I'll, I'll have to go back and do a little bit more research, but I would certainly reference that note that Matt Homewood put up. Thanks, Matt. Well, I, there's a guy named Lee Cooperman we're going to bring on. And I have, I, Lee likes to meet at Panera. I'm guessing he's an investor. So maybe he's got influence. Uh, Sort of the way our network would work. Anyone else? I'd like to raise a topic. Um, this section was about ag tech, but we didn't talk a lot about, we talked a lot about Africa. And of course, I'm not really into Africa that much. I apologize, but I'm very much focused on America. I'm very much focused in Philadelphia. Uh, Washington to Bo Wash uh, Washington to Boston, 52 million people. Large number of those people are getting their food from food banks. So I'm in the indoor vertical farming thing. That's probably everybody knows by now who's uh, talked to me for 10 seconds. Um, anyhow, uh, I like to just talk about the issues about America, about you know inner city, um, le high levels of ob uh, obesity, high levels of uh, uh, obesity and all the related diseases, diabetes, and it's all related to nutrition and related to food and related to ag. And so much of this, you know, America is so wealthy and so, you know, so wealthy and so powerful and, and really a good country. I'm a Canadian. Um, but there's not a lot being done. Like there's a lot of talk and it's a problem today. It's not a problem, you know, 20 years from now. It's like right now. Um, I was listening to a, a podcast um, from the Feeding America. 50 million, 50 million Americans are, you know, are, are food insecure. You know, Matt mentioned earlier about 25% of, the, you know, is enough food being wasted that would get rid of all food insecurity. I'd like to throw it out to the panel and to the smart people here. And to me, this is just a massive business opportunity. It's just lots of money to be made in food. Luke, uh, you were speaking on the prep call um, about different ways to in, use storage in different parts of the chain. Um, are you on by chance? Maybe you can uh, expound on that part of the solution. Yeah, I'm on. Um, in fact, uh, Richard probably could speak a little better on that because um, that's how I'm associated with Richard with Global Food Exchange. I mean, uh, within every life cycle, there's, there's, you know, we got to look at it from a 
a very uh, strategic uh, macro level and, and very fine tune all the areas that uh, uh, potential waste or um, gaps can be capitalized on uh, for you know future food storage, spoilage, uh, waste. I mean, every area, I'm sure you can identify opportunities along that life cycle and the supply chain. And uh, Richard, um, I know with uh, Global Food Exchange, that's, that's one of the, the key areas that they really kind of uh, uh, honed in on, on uh, food as an asset and better ways to manage it why, by capitalizing uh, food at a, at, once it's harvest, dehydrating it and reconstituting it at a future date um, to retain its nutritional value. So I'm actually going to turn it over to Richard to maybe talk a little bit more about that and what, you know, the global food exchange model and the technology behind it uh, could help in this area. Thanks, Luke. I'll, I'll make it brief because I don't want to take over the session, but the, um, some of this is things that we already talked about. Global Food Exchange is the U.S. version of World Food Bank. And Global Food Exchange's goal, which is why we're working with mayors and governors and FEMA, is to be able to buy domestic produced food that's either number twos, overripe, or excess use from grocery stores to buy that, take it to a local area, clean it, dry it through a Typically, it's just dehydrated. You can do freeze drying in some areas, but typically it's just dehydrated. We take that dehydrated, put it into our airtight storage bags, and then those can be reused. They can be used by local stores to put into pizzas or what have you. Or what we do is, especially on the fruits and vegetables, we add the fruits back into our fortified cereals to be used for the, the, uh, the breakfast feeding program uh, sponsored by USDA. So our goal is to take that national. So we're taking the wasted food that we're buying it and we're now paying the grocery stores for that. So I'm paying them 25 to 45 cents on the dollar to buy that extra fruit and vegetables. The vegetables will go into lunch uh, products or be sold as additives for mm -hmm. people that are putting it typically in frozen foods. The, the fruits are typically added into our cereals and those cereals then are pushed out for less than 15 cents a meal into the USDA um, lunch feeding program. So it's a way to cut the cost from $1.89, which is what it is now. You still have, you're still going to need 30% of that for logistics and service and cooks, but for 15 cents is your food cost. Uh, so oh. that's just one solution and it helps a lot, but it doesn't, it doesn't solve everything, but it, it puts a big dent in it. Richard, ready to talk, you said something which um, was very interesting. You said you were a for-profit. So what kind of returns right. are, and this is really a whole session is really about returns for investors. Sure. What kind of returns are you giving to your investors? Well, the we've, we've actually, are, we've been investing in this for seven years, building the models we've manufactured. We have a million meals sitting now. We're just now going through the FEMA. Uh, we've been approved by FEMA for all of our stuff at Cinderleaf. Red Cross, Salvation Army. So if any organization uses our food for disaster response, they're reimbursed at about two and a half, three X. So they make money on it. We make money on that. Um, on the food program, we're trying, as I said, we're just launching with the, the conference of black mayors with a, a, there's a whole slew. You'll hear about it in the next, before the end of the year, there's a 12 or 15 famous you know, athletes and musicians and stuff that'll be out promoting this effort for the USDA to adopt this uh, as, a, as a target. So we're hoping to target probably in the Midwest. But, but the key though, is you have to have that partnership with groups like Nick, like Mark with Kroger. And because they have to be willing to do some of that. And you also have to have the partnership as Joe, I think was mentioning earlier, it's, it, it's people are not used to doing things with partners. They want to stay in their own lane. But when you want to develop an efficient ecosystem, it almost by nature requires that you have some partners. So yes. Feeding America, you don't want to take all of their food because they have people they're taking care of and they need that food for free. Right. Because they're raising money for logistics, right? So you want to make sure that you're not discounting what they're doing, but there still is a huge amount of loss, right? A lot of times they take everything because they are, see that as a service to the grocer. But then they turn around and take 70% of what's given to them and they throw it away. What we want to do is to say the stuff, there's 10 or 15% should just be put into a bioreactor. We're not sure that they make money because of the logistics cost doing it that way. But 50% of that will probably go to groups like Feeding America. They're going to use to, and, and again, you have to put it in priority. 
the people that need to eat today are more important than us drying it for people that are going to need it for disaster in a year, right? So you have to feed the people that need it today as priority. That which they don't need today or tomorrow, we take that and push and dry it. And we process that and, and then store it. Inside of that, the returns that, that we've walked out are in the high 20s to high 40s. So somewhere between 28 and 45% IRRs. And you're solving a huge, huge social impact issue, right? And you're- I, 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 wanna, I wanna pat you on the back. There's the other thing you're doing is you're, you're, curating, you're managing the entire food chain back to the farmer. One of the biggest things that was done during, um, one of, not this, the one, the 1.9 billion, but one of the other uh, uh, investments was a thing called uh, uh, Farmers to Families program where they were starting to just buy up food so that the farmers wouldn't grow back. When the food, when restaurants shut down 50%, a lot of farmers almost went broke because all of a sudden, you know, 50%, 75% of their food was sold through, for, through uh, to the food service. So you're, you, by buying from retails, are just making sure the entire chain continues to run. Um, on top of what you're doing, uh, there's a guy in Philadelphia you should reach out to. I don't know him, but I know of him, Jeff Brown. He runs um, a dozen um, shop rights. He owns a dozen shop rights, and they're all located in what would be called food deserts. Obviously, once he puts a shop right in a food desert, it's not a food desert, but, but traditionally it would be a food desert. And he's working with communities that typically, you know, 40% poverty rate, but those are his customers. And he's doing very, very well. And his stores are just beautiful. And you, you know, walking in there, you wouldn't even realize that you're in that kind of area in the city. Um, he may, he may want to do some of the stuff that you're doing. And he may even take the product back as a dry, free dried product. And right. so, right. like, I, I, like, you didn't mention anything about putting those products that you're buying as waste and putting them back on the shelf as a retail product. You're, you're exactly right. And then you could end up having, you know, I know that people teasingly call Whole Foods whole paycheck, right? right it's right, very right. expensive. So we talk about all this new advanced nutrition, but quite frankly, the, the low income and even the, the lower middle income people don't eat that very often because right, it's, right. That's it's just right. too expensive. This is that alternative. You could actually take what they're buying for Four ninety nine for a one and a half ounce bag and get it to them for a dollar ninety nine or right. something. So exactly one right. Of the problem, one of the causes of obesity and diabetes is people just don't have access to fresh food at a low cost. Right. Like processed foods are so much cheaper to manufacture, and and because of the logistics of it, uh, supply chain uh, loss loss. I mean, you know, the part that the dollars and cents part of which you kind of been talking around, but nobody really spoke about it. You know, you bring food from California, I was, you know, California, Mexico, and uh, Arizona, and you ship it to the West Coast, East Coast, 50 cents out of every dollar is just the shipping thing, right? With the stuff that you're capturing, you, you know, that, that's where the, it's a shipping stuff. So if you can use this food, the shipping's already paid for to bring it to the East Coast. And for you to sell it, you know, it's just your processing added on processing. Right, right. And the, and the irony of it is, it's actually not terribly expensive. Um, the, the cost to build one of these buildings is a, a half a million to a million and a half dollars. It's these are walk-in dryers, right? You have processors. Are you, are you, using, gas or or are you using gas or electric? Um, well, we have electric in some places, but the preponderance is gas. It's just a lot more efficient in most places. So I want to point. Uh, you know, everybody pushes Ohio. I'm going to push Pennsylvania. You know, six six cents a kilowatt hour. Wow, that's pretty good. That's well, pretty we're not too far. We have a lot of gas too. Anyways, <laughs> uh, so I was just looking all this, the and my network, uh, board members of the Greater Chicago Food Depository, uh, equivalents in the uh, Middle East, uh, UK Food Act, Food Tech. Some of these people just didn't come today. Uh, we have all of our impact people coming on the twenty fourth, which is, would give us a chance to revisit some of these and do a breakout. Um, and I'm, you know, we're looking for good investment. Sounds like Richard, you might be one. We're looking for, for our, uh, you know, funds and, um, and, and founders, you know, we prefer to find the funds. They'll find the founders because they're better at it than we are, but we'll at least give everybody a little, a lot of attention and interaction here. Um, but some of the, we, we talked, one takeaway is we want, we want a hemp deep dive, um, uh, we want a dumpster deep dive. Sorry, just. 
Yeah. Well, we're, we Whatever. want to bring some of these solutions. We can come at it from the philanthropic side, definitely. Um, Mark, I think, no, I think more, uh, you want to talk about, you want a food deep dive. Right, right. Food. It's really food that's that you're focusing in on, not, and Please. everything else kind of centers around down, food. Down, downstream. Um, we'll turn off. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, and just to throw out another topic too is, um, you know, with food, I, I talk to a lot of chefs here because um, I'm associated with that industry a little bit. Um, but during the pandemic, uh, you know, when restaurants were shut down and, and restaurants were just changing over to their their model to just the takeout model, I mean, they really had to modify a lot their menus, everything. Um, but you know, one of the chefs really came up with. Uh, a uh, pretty ingenious thing. I mean, he does real high-end um, uh, food, very artsy and everything in a very high-end restaurant. But uh, what he did was um, uh, because of, you know, the pandemic and everybody's scared about contamination and everything, but uh, there's a technology called sous vide. Um, and I'm not sure if anybody knows what that is, but it's basically cooking food uh, within a bag and boiling it within uh, a, a certain temperature of water. Uh, and it never goes above that temperature for the food. So it's, it's you know, depending on the temperature you set it at, it cooks it. Um, but anyway, he kind of did portion sizes because he said that Americans, they don't really know how to portion things. And what he did was he just basically portioned it and stuck everything in there for, um, you know, the type of food that it was. And then all you had to do, it was frozen and everything, pull it out it unfreezes or you can put it right into the water and it cooks and it, it's it's completely safe and uh he he blew up his re uh, his business blew up here in um scottsdale area because all the, the the people that usually go out for real nice uh uh food um you know went to his website ordered all kinds of stuff and so that he's trying to get that out into the masses same thing with freshly they do portion control a little better. Um, so maybe partnering with companies like that um, with some of those waste products could get the, the price down even more for a lot of different families. So just things like that, just, you know, just to put it in perspective. I mean, the food area, like you said, it, it's it's so massive. Well, it sort of reminds me on, on, on of thinking about supply chains for cannabis. If we think about the food supply chain, there's another family, uh, I don't know if Mark's still on, but Ben the Zeitz family, they're uh, fourth generation farmers. And they have, I think I want to say he's got 30, 40,000 head of cattle, all grass fed, which goes back to your uh, emissions issues. Um, you know, with, you know, cows, it's, I, I don't know what proportion, like 20% less of the emissions come from, um, from, from that part of the, the chain. And then he's got a potato farm. He's a meat and potato guy. But he wants to go direct, but then you got, you know, Walmart is killing it. or, you know, and so he's, but technology and to, to consumer could be an answer. He's literally, he, he either has to build or find partners to, to go around that. And, and by the way, he also owns High Times, the, the cannabis magazine. Oh, interesting. <laughs> and, and, and he's in the cannabis space. But if we could bring the food people, and I did this with, with my Michigan event. Four years ago, that's how Mark White met Ben Zeitz. Um, is bring the 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 founders to the to the angel investors by these rooms. So we haven't done that. We've been doing these deep dives, which I think is actually working. Um, so I, I like the the whole like it could be a food summit, right? You don't have to limit it to uh, and and then we could you could go to those rooms and then then we debrief. Because a lot of this is, you know, is is about interconnecting. Maybe we could even have like, with a break, we could have a set of, of where people people like Richard, you know, we could have geography based. Um, but let's it takes a little a lot of thinking to have to, to map that out. Um, Mark, just real quick, it's Vlad. Um, you know, there's a complementary aspect here with hemp because our proposition is a zero waste proposition. Uh, mm -hmm. We're also looking heavily into hemp milk and working with dairy farmers uh, who are struggling mm -hmm. uh, and making that transition. And a lot of that's being done here in Ohio as well. So just wanted to put that in there as well. So 
Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think that's a great idea to, to, to do kind of a summit format. And, and, you know, this is not technically a deep dive. This is a, a broad kind of coverage of everything that we could talk about with some sort of a, I guess, burger theme or lettuce and, and fake meat theme. Uh, but, uh, but I think it'd be great to dive into some of these specific things. I unfortunately have to run, Mark. Um, I, I'm over quite a bit on another you know, important. You, you run. Uh, oh, we can keep going. You can wrap up. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. I really enjoyed the session. So appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Anand, as usual.